We are back. Legendary Sickos, a legendary upside, and Spike Week collaboration after a brief hiatus. We are back today to talk about stacking. Myself, Eric Beinfor, and Pat Corain, winner of Best Ball Mania 3 and creator of Legendary Upside, are going to dive into all the nooks and crannies of stacking. How do you implement your stacks in your drafts? What's an appropriate way to put together different stacks and maybe a little bit of galaxy brain and how we can take down these tournaments with our stacking. Let's do it. All right, Pat, we're back. The people were not very happy with me for the last couple of weeks, and I will take ownership over the fact that we uh, had a little brief hiatus here with with this show, um, some scheduling conflicts. Sometimes the real real life does get in the way, even when you work from home, creating fantasy football content for a living. And But I am excited to, to get back, and today we are going to talk a little bit of stacking. We've obviously talked quite a few kind of gal brain type of conversations obviously week 17 and how we can do some different things to try to take down these tournaments from a correlation perspective but we haven't really like dug into like the actual stack right like if i want to stack the eagles or i want to stack the chiefs or i want to or just gen- general stacking like do i include running backs you know what do i do with quarterbacks and tight ends can i just stack a quarterback with a tight end do i need a wide receiver like there's so many different elements to stacking that I don't think that there's necessarily a right or a wrong answer, but I'm interested to dive into like physically when I get on the board or on the clock in a draft, like how do I start to put together these stacks that can best win me these best ball tournaments? Yeah, for sure. I think it's really interesting. I don't think there's like a clear cut answer. I think like there's things that I do sometimes where I'm like, I don't know if I should do this, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> yep. um, and so like when I draft with other people, sometimes, um, you know, I'll be talking about stacking and spot where they're like, it's too early to think about that. So I think there's there's sort of uh, maybe some different uh, philosophies among really sharp drafters that I get to draft with as well. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of an interesting thing to think through because I do think there's a number of ways to attack it. I think those are the most fun conversations. Like, I actually think like the week 17 thing is like almost become a little bit boring because, not again, not that there's necessarily a right or a wrong answer, but it's fairly straightforward. It, it's kind of funny how quickly we evolve in the space because it, even last year, certainly two years ago, the whole week 17 and kind of playoff correlation stuff was scoffed at, right? And now it's not that it's universally accepted, but it is that like, I don't know, you get to, everybody kind of understands, get to a certain spot of a draft. All these guys are the same. One of them plays, you know, against my quarterback in week 17. I'll, I'll take that guy. It may, you know, it makes sense. I think we've wrapped our heads around that. But like, I, like you said, I, I don't, I really, I do some things I think that are, that other people would probably say, not only do they not do, they might think are suboptimal. Um, and so the fact that there's so many different ways to think about putting together these forms of stacks. And I think, like you said, sharp drafters all do it differently, but sharp drafters also, do tons of different things. I think when I first started in best ball, I pretty much like played it like building a DFS team, really. Um, meaning, okay, so I'm I'm thinking about the price of the stack like as a whole, and that was like the driving force behind everything. Like I was never gonna like do a premium double stack, right? I was never gonna have Jamar Chase and T Higgins with Joe Burrow because I'm I was thinking about it through that. DFS lens like I wouldn't really do that in a DFS contest because they're so expensive it's really cost prohibitive they need to score 50 points or something and even then you know I still might lose because it could just be really lopsided to Jamar Chase or to T Higgins and so I've definitely evolved my thought on that but I, I don't even think that that premise is wrong in a vacuum but it's that there's so many other different ways that you can go about stacking so I wanted to like start with how, like when you get into a room and you said, I want to build like not a specific team or anything like that, but I'm, I'm going to put together the stack based on how this draft is, is folding out. What would be like the perfect way for you to do it really, really cheap or like an elite quarterback with his number one wide receiver. Or like, if you had to pick your perfect way to start a stack, if you got to choose, what would it be? I think it would be, hmm, I, I mean, like Josh Allen is a, is a good one. I think where, 
you can get digs. I, I would want to tackle on Gabe Davis, right? Because he's going to have some big spike weeks. I'd run a tackle on one of the two running backs who are both pretty cheap, you know, yep. and I, I kind of, you know, I'm more of a Knox guy on the tight end side, but if I could throw Knox on there, that's ideal. And then look, if I wanted to at the end, throw on a Khalil Shakir, Deontay Hardy, uh, I'm open to that too. So, you know, for me, it's like, because of um, the prices on those guys, I think you can kind of do like the full stack. Um but I, you know, in general, like I do, I, I want to have at least a double stack ideally. And then I also prefer to have the running back rather than not. Okay. That's in, that's interesting. I think <clears throat> I've, I've come along to that a little bit more, particularly this year. I definitely do it a lot more this year than I have historically. And that's one of those funny things where, like I said, when I came from this DFS angle, I really didn't do. <clears throat> and the, the 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 specialized pass catching back has like really vanished from the NFL. It's kind of funny how fast that happened. Like just a couple of years ago when we were talking about best ball, we were debating what to do with James White and JD McKissick and right all these guys and like they almost don't really exist anymore. Um I guess like a, a, a Ty Montgomery or something <laughs> like that, I guess, and he's not even a running back on underdog. Um but I would maybe include a guy like that. Right. If I'm stacking the Patriots, I might include James White, but I wasn't even like really considering, you know, including um, Devin Singletary with my Josh Allen stacks. Because again, from a one week DFS lineup example, it's not that you can't win, of course, with a running back and the quarterback. Again, the offense scores 50 points and they're they're priced appropriately. And God forbid, you know. Uh, Mahomes and McKinnon was one that certainly worked because McKinnon was basically just a wide receiver. But I, they're they're negatively correlated, right? If Damian yeah. Harris scores a rushing touchdown, that's a touchdown that obviously Josh Allen can't run for, and Josh Allen can't throw for, which in turn takes away from the receivers that you you also included with Josh Allen. So I was thinking about it through that lens, and I couldn't get past that roadblock of just being like, no, like Damian Harris's big games come at the expense of all of these other guys, so I don't want to draft him with them. But I've really come around to to this what you just said in that I kind of think price uh, assuming price, right. It's um, I'm trying to think uh, uh, CMC and Austin Eckler are kind of the pass get, but Bijan, you know, if, if Ritter were a seventh round pick Bijan plus Ritter plus London plus Pitts at those prices, I probably wouldn't want to do it as much. But like you said, a lot of these guys, Damian Harris, even the, the chiefs running backs are cheap. Um, I'm trying to think of some other uh, the all the Eagles running backs backs yeah. are cheap and you can get you can just soak up all of the points from these really good offenses by including this back or even if the offense isn't already really good and established if it becomes a good offense now you can soak up all of those right um <laughs> I don't want to do the the Howell thing again but Howell or Brissett but Gibson right Brian, Brian Robinson um, those guys are cheap on, on that offense, et cetera. Yeah, throw those guys on. So, you know, not to get into the house stuff, but I have a lot of commanders. I take a lot of, um, uh, Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, yep. Brian Robinson, uh, a little bit less Antonio Gibson actually right now. Cause he's risen so much in price. Um, like almost closing in on three around a three round rise. Uh, yeah, it's pretty soon crazy. Here. Um, so I've been kind of sitting that, that rise out and, um, you know, Maybe I'll, I'll get more of him later uh, once the once the coaches remind us that they don't like him on any level. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, to me, I'm like, I, that's kind of a different thing, which we should get into later, sort of stacking without the quarterback. But I'm yep. betting – I'm just betting on that offense. You know, I'm, I think that offense, despite my reservations on how specifically, those reservations generally are on him holding the job for the full season. Yeah. Um, and Very different conversation from being – interested in, in being commanders fun. yeah be fun like be fun and get benched like i can win i just don't draft you and then jacoby Brissett can be you know can execute it's like Fitzpatrick patrick and Jameis. it's like a, a div, much different version of Fitzpatrick and yeah. Jameis, right right it doesn't really matter have... which one's in there they're gonna sling that... it around and score points exactly that's my that's my thought on the commander's offense you can you know if, if your thought is it's going to be so fun that he keeps the job and I'm also going to win by, <laughs> by getting that on my team. Fair enough. But you know, that's, that's another thing I like to think about is like, 
am, I'm just betting on the offense. Even if I don't have a lot of confidence in, you know, the quarterback holding the job all season, I can still bet on the offense exceeding expectations. Washington, the perfect way to, uh, the perfect offense this season to kind of take that point of view, I think, because the backup is pretty interesting. The backup can execute yep. the offense. So, uh, yeah, that that's definitely one that I think about. I also would say on those elite offenses, I like taking Rashad Penny with Jalen Hurts. I like taking Damian Harris with Josh Allen. I'm not necessarily even going for the positive correlation in a one-week sample. I'm not going for the Jarek McKinnon. I mean, I, I will take the, Jer- the James Cook, who could be the Jarek McKinnon, but yeah. honestly, he's probably more of like an explosion rusher, right? It's like it's, mm-hmm. like, it's probably – uh, you know, closer to a Tony Pollard or something, where he's right. scoring. His on ceiling case is place. probably Paul. Like that's the pipe dream is he's Tony Pollard or something. I think that that yeah. makes a lot of sense. I just don't think that Josh Allen's not going to check it down enough, right? It's just not. <laughs> yeah. So, but maybe he's really good and is scoring from you know probably a ways out, but but delivering you some really nice spike weeks. But the reason that I like taking those like pure two down guys is that they don't cost a ton. They're in a range of the draft where if they just happen to, you know, contribute, you know, fairly frequently for your teams, get in the end zone a bunch over the course of the season, they're going to have strong advance rates. They're going to help me get there. It's just, and I've already bet on the offense. I've already said the Bills are going to crush this year. The Bills are going to be great or the Eagles are going to be great. Those aren't particularly, like, I'm not really even out on a limb with those bets, right? Those are (laughs) like the best offenses bets in the league. So I'm just, I'm saying, I already know the Bills are going to crush. I already bet this whole team on it. I'm just I'm going to tack on, you know, a 10th round pick to, you know, if I'm taking Harris or, or Penny, right? I'm tacking on a 10th round pick to just, you know, put a little extra down on, on that bet that I've already made. And the payoff could be pretty nice because maybe I only have one running back to that point, two running backs to that point. That running back hit in that range, which traditionally has been a very good range to draft running backs, the wide receivers I hate in that range. You know, I, I may already have an elite quarterback. I don't need to take a quarterback in the 10th round if I've got Allen or Hurts. You know, so I'm it's kind of I'm already like trying to take a running back. So why wouldn't it's I take tight a tight end back? dead zone? It's borderline the tight end, right? It's Evan Ingram and I don't mind Pat Fryermuth or whatever in Joku, but like those guys are not like the, uh I, I I just recently wrote an article, but I was referencing some projections and we we posted weekly projections to the site a while back, and that range of tight end is like in all those Ingram, Fryermuth, and Joku that go in that range of tight end project for like one more point than like 16th round tight ends per on a you know per game. Yeah. The running backs, as you said, Damian Harris, Rashad Penny, Antonio, pick your guy around the pick 100 to 120. Those guys project for like seven more points than than a running back just like three rounds later, two or three rounds later. So like that range is is I did want to bring out like. That, it's a pretty good sweet spot of the draft as well, so it really does fall together, to your point. It's a sweet spot in terms of the profiles this year, and it traditionally, you know, historically, has been a sweet spot for years. It's where we tend to – it's the uncertain range of, you know, backfields that we don't have certainty on. Those backs tend to fall in that range. Backs where there's multiple back. There's a reason why Brian Robinson and Antonio Gibson are right there, because we're not sure. <laughs> yep. Right? Javante they, and P. Ryan, Cook and Harris, they all – every backfield, yeah. it's 100%. That's true. Yeah. So I want to be – you know, you're, I feel like I'm kind of fishing with dynamite when I take running backs in that range. I want to be overweight on running backs from those rounds to begin with. If I can take a running back who already fits with my bet that this offense is going to score a ton of points, amazing. The other thing is, you know, it, it's a little harder to do with – if you have um, Hertz or Allen, because if Hertz or Allen had completely duds in any of the three playoff weeks, and especially week 17, you're not going to finish first. But I do think there's scenarios where in week 15 and 16, you could sneak by with an underwhelming Bills yep. performance. If you did, if you stacked it the way I was describing before, we have like six pieces of the offense probably not. <laughs> Yeah. But if you, but in a more forty percent of your team is the offense, you, you, I'm not sure you could suffer through a, um, like Damian Harris. God, I you love him. He's my, high, he's my highest on <laughs> running back. A Damian Harris spike week in week sixteen is not carrying seven other bills. To no, the, to no, the it's not. It is not. But let's talk about the Eagles, and, and we saw what they did last year when they were absolutely rolling teams. 
Jalen Hurts can get there. You know, he doesn't have the biggest week ever, but he carries along one of his two top weapons, and then they just, like, salt the game away with Rashad mm-hmm. Penny, and Penny has a massive week, and this is a, another key consideration. I don't think the field is all that excited to put Penny on their Hurts teams. So I do think there's a little bit of built-in leverage where if Penny goes off in week 15 or 16, he might actually carry in a lower percentage of Fields teams or yep. um, of Hurts teams. Excuse me. I'm, yep. I just called him uh, Justin Fields. Yeah, <laughs> it, a lower percentage of, of Jalen Hurts teams. And I might have an underrepresented Eagles stack despite the Eagles being amazing and allowing Rashad Penny to have this massive week the week before. And like you said, I think it's so important. Uh, clearly, you were just outlining, and it seemed to happen every goddamn week with the Eagles. That's why it's so prevalent, like in our minds. The first half, right? It's 28 nothing at halftime. Hertz has got 250 passing yards and three touchdowns. AJ Brown's got 101 or 102, or you know, vice versa to Devonta Smith, pick one. And then the second half, Miles Sanders runs for 80 more yards and a touchdown. And, you know, and then it's Boston Scott or Kenny Gainwell on the last two drives. It was like every other week was this for the Eagles. <clears throat> but what you're like in the week 15 and 16, it's still hard in best ball mania specifically. Now, we're, we'll talk a little bit about I wanted to get to how this translates to different tournaments that aren't quite as difficult as BBM to advance throughout not only your regular season, but each week of the uh, the playoffs. We are in the midst, uh, almost done, with uh, our Bulldog draft here at Spike Week. Myself, Silas Jackson, Trev, and Rob uh, are uh, tag-teaming, quad-teaming a $500 Bulldog slow draft and recording kind of our thoughts at each pick. We actually pick at the, at the turn, so it works out. Uh, we t- make two picks for every video we record. But in that tournament, Four out of 12 advance to the playoffs. So double the amount of teams compared to, say, BBM or really any best ball tournament. And then it's like two out of six advance in week 15, and then maybe one out of six in week 16. And then it's a tiny, tiny five, yeah. know, eight teams or something About like as that. as small as underdog gets, yeah. Yeah, it's super, super small. And so that tournament compared to BBM, you may need to side. It's a, it's a tighter... Uh, needle to thread with doing what we're talking about, what you're talking about, especially with a Jalen Hurts or a Josh Allen in BBM, because it really, like you really, it is going to be tough if Jalen Hurts scores 16 points or whatever in week 16. Uh, you're really going to need a monster game from from a che- your, your cheaper quarterback that you probably used. In these other tournaments, which there are tons of, um, not just this Bulldog, tons of other tournaments where like, you can, can you beat, four other teams in week 15 with, you know, eight, 17, 18 points from Jalen hurts and like 16 from AJ Brown. If yeah. Rashad Penny has 20 abso fucking lootly, you can, you can move on and do that. And so, um, a lot I of think you can also, we- you can also, th- those types of tournaments are the ones where I'm more interested in doing the Devonte Smith plus AJ Brown plus Jalen hurts. Yeah. Like plus Goddard. Right. That's where I'd be like, you know mm-hmm. what? Screw it. Like, I just need Hertz plus two, like Hertz plus two in any of these playoff rounds. It's like, I'm already and if, if I sacrifice my first round pick to get that, like I'm, I'm only taking, I only need to beat five other teams. Like, I think I'm probably okay. Like if I, you know, and now if I'm there with a bunch of other Hertz stacks, maybe I'm not, but you know, but that's also rare because in these smaller fields, a, there's only so many teams. So, like, right. there's only one Jalen Hurts team in every draft, and, and I'm going to use this Bulldog as an example. There's only 432 teams total in the whole in the, in the whole thing. So that's not 432 Jalen Hurts teams. That's 432 total teams, right? So divide that by 12 to get the number of Jalen Hurts teams. How many 36. of them – how many <laughs> – 36 Jalen Hurts teams. How many of them are just naked Jalen Hurts? How many of them have just A.J. Brown? How many of them just have Devonta Smith or just Dallas Goddard? We tried. We took AJ Brown. We, AJ Brown fell to us at the 111 in our Bulldog draft, and then uh, at the beginning of the second round, we actually took Devonta Smith uh, to try to do basically what you just you just outlined. Now Jalen Hurts went a couple picks before us in the the third round, but also that that was fine. Now we just made this big bet on the Eagles, but we didn't get Hurts. We're totally fine. But to your point, we specifically targeted that 
because AJ Brown fell to us in this in this contest. Whereas <clears throat> in Best Ball Mania, so I don't know I don't know that I'll have any of the premium uh, Eagles things, or, or I'm not sure I've even tried for it yet. I'm not saying that's right either, but I'm just saying I'm thinking about BBM differently than the other tournaments, and I think it's important that we we outline that. Yeah, and I you know I have played around with like trying to do the premium double um i think in bbm i don't know that i pulled it off in bbm i was gonna say do you have any i'm not sure actually i've, I've done like 33 bbm teams i think I, i'm not sure if i have any uh there but it certainly is less interesting in best ball mania where you have to finish first out of 16 first out of 16 again i mean i do think that it's possible to advance and it could be quite uh it could be interesting you know if you able are able to get like a, a low owned Devonte smith through to the final right or a low owned aj brown because one that's of them the blows reason. up that's the yeah. reason to do it is like you almost it's not a guarantee but you almost do guarantee yourself if it hits one of those receivers like can't be super super popular in the finals right yeah i think that one issue that I have with it is that it's actually hard to complete. So if I knew that, like, if I take AJ Brown a little early, let's say ahead of Kelsey, you know, not like reaching up above Hill or, mm -hmm. or Cup, but I just take him ahead, ahead of Kelsey, and then I can get Devontae Smith very easily in the second, and then I know Hertz is always there in the third. I'd be more willing to do it. But the fact that I'm like, sometimes I, I've done it once in the puppy where Hertz got sniped and then I took Allen. And I was like, well, like, <laughs> like I'm just, maybe I can, but then I, you know, that might not be very good because now I've spent a ton of capital. I, it's like a little thin, right? You need like, that's other can we talk about that though? For, can we talk about that though for a second? Because that's kind of interesting from a stacking perspective. We'll definitely get to the stacking without the quarterback, but this kind of is a uh, some part of it. That too. is sort of stacking without the quarterback. But I mean, then you, what's a big perk of stacking without the quarterback? Generally, like. I asked you at the very top, like, oh, if you had it to do, you know, you had, uh, you got to pick your absolute perfect stack or, or whatever. Part of mine might actually have, <clears throat> will almost assuredly have stacks without the quarterback, but it's going to be with like the pocket passer. So, like last year, <laughs> clearly didn't work very well uh, because your team won with Tom, <laughs> with Tom Brady, but I wasn't drafting Tom Brady, but I wasn't ignoring the Bucks, even though I was kind of like down on the Bucks, but like Chris Scott, I drafted a, fuck ton of chris of chris godwin last year right like i was drafting these at rashad white i know you you uh you know were big on rashad white last year i was drafting the bucks a hundred percent but i was doing essentially this stacking without the quarterback because it's so hard for a guy who literally has no rushing in his profile aaron say aaron Rodgers this year i'm drafting the jets but i really don't take aaron Rodgers that much unless right he falls past adp i don't have a quarterback yet i kind of just need it I'm not like going out of my way to to take him, but it's because of kind of what you started to hint at at that example. You can still get the juice out of Hertz is a little different, but you can still get the juice out of the Eagles and then pivot to the Bills. And now you have just this mega team, right? Now you take Rashad Penny later and you load up with all those bills you used in your example, right? Now you, you won't have digs, <clears throat> but maybe that's okay, right? You just piecemeal all these other, you get Gabe, you get, uh, one of the tight ends, you get Damian Harris, you throw on Khalil Shakir later, and it's like, I don't know. Now I got I'm loaded up with the Eagles and Bills. I can kind of like ping pong around uh different weeks. I almost feel like if that's not a, a, an interesting way to do it, I you know, I don't know about Josh Allen a hundred percent, but I think that that build is like kind of interesting from a stacking perspective. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And um, you know, when Liam won two years ago, he had Jamar Chase, but he had Josh Allen. You know, of course, he did, right. right? So he, he didn't he didn't have Joe Burrow, you know, and the you know, you will see the elite quarterback separate some. But in terms of where you get the most separation and kind of what pieces are most likely to be like the absolute had to have pieces, they're going to be more skill players. You know, in, in his case, um, it was Amon Ross St. Brown. Like you had you had to have Amon Ross St. Brown in and Rashad Penny and Funny Rashad enough. Penny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, despite Burrow going off, you could get by without him. As field sizes increase, that becomes less and less the case. You'll need closer to the pure nuts, the bigger that the field is. But, you know, best ball mania is not exactly how I would have designed it this year. But I kind of like that the field size 
you know, is roughly the same as last year. It's actually a little bit smaller. <clears throat> so it isn't now to the point where we need to start thinking like we got to do single stacks, like anything over, you know, round five, we can only stack one because we need that mm-hmm. guy to go off at the other. We can't do this stuff where you can go in, you can kind of go in and basically understand that most likely one of Devontae Smith or AJ Brown's probably not going to do much this week, but you're just hoping the other one blows up. Like, Nope, there's going to be a team in there that that has the right single stack, and that's going to beat you. There might not be, you know. There's not that many yep. teams. That, sure, certainly there will be single stacks, but they might not have the other pieces that you need. And there's so many roster spots compared to DFS. There's 18 roster spots. Like if you have a, a you know a last round, you know 16th round pick that puts up like 30 points. I mean, there's not going to be that many teams with that guy. So now it comes down to who had that guy plus the right other stuff. So I, that's why I think yep. it's a much more nuanced conversation than a DFS where it's like, yeah, if you try to put together Hertz, Devontae De- Smith, and AJ Brown on a DFS lineup, you don't if they if one of those guys fails, like the, the lineup fails because they were so expensive. Um, if one of those guys fails in not just week 17, but week 15 or 16, in week 15 or 16, it can actually be good. Because it gives yeah. you leverage. And in week 17, you can overcome it. I, I did not have my second round pick hit my lineup in week 17. Saquon Barkley dudded out. Daniel Jones went off. Daniel Jones didn't hit my my final lineup because, again, quarterbacks don't always even hit your lineup, even if they have good good weeks, because they don't separate quite as much as yeah, he scored like 35 points and didn't make your lineup. Didn't hit my lineup. <laughs> right. That kind of thing can happen like way more frequently because you only start one. I mean, it's like it's just simple math, right? You only start one. So, but the the example I think still is interesting that second round pick Saquon Barkley doesn't do anything. Quarterback goes off. I did have him stacked with Wandale Robinson. He was injured and didn't, didn't matter. But, you know, that kind of general theory of things like worked out. I It didn't end up helping me in any way. <laughs> but, but there was uh, at the same time, you would maybe think that not having my second round pick hit my lineup would have hurt me more than it did. But in fact, Saquon Barkley was hugely owned in the final and being able to get there without him was helpful because uh, had Saquon gone off a lot more teams, you know, that looked like mine, right, would have been uh, along for the for the ride at the top of the standings. Getting Mostert, who slotted in with like 19 points to replace Barkley, was a huge blessing because Mostert yeah. was not someone who was who was nearly as well represented. It's so interesting because um... – We started kind of with it it all does kind of end up coming back to this leverage idea. And we started with it on like, okay, uh, essentially the Damien Harris, Rashad Penny, et cetera, all that is it's not just leverage because, of course, like you said, you're making this big bet on this offense. There's ways that in any given week they can everybody can eat. Right. If the pie is big enough everybody can fucking eat in a in a, a single week we saw that with the eagles last last year we see it with the chiefs sometimes right we used to see it with the chiefs um when they had uh tyreek and kelsey right it'd be like mahomes tyreek and kelsey and a running back would score 18 points or whatever because they if they if that team scored 40 something it's a lot of fantasy points to go around so it's not that it's only leverage but in this game like we know inherently that leverage is like the most important thing in this whole freaking right you snuck a bucks stack a bucks with dj Moore bring back stack into the into the finals and austin eckler who was hilariously not that popular in the final despite being the the rb1 yeah because justin jefferson was he yeah exactly it was hard to get there without jefferson he just blew away the field and he had a good playoff up until week 17 right Mm -hmm. so like you said it's really hard to get there but that isn't manufactured leverage that was um found the leverage it just, just happened to it you was it was luck yeah you stumbled yeah. across it right you didn't found follow the leverage. The fu- there, there, there was no <laughs> you weren't following some path to the end of the rainbow yeah. where it was this fucking pot of gold it just landed you know it fell out of, it was it's cloudy with a chance of meatballs it just fell out of the fucking sky yeah. and landed yeah, fell to in you. my lap yeah. Yeah. yeah which is i mean that's gonna that more often than not that's going to happen but we're also in search of ways to give ourselves leverage 
if at all possible, when something breaks our way. The Jones one and was real leverage. The Jones one didn't hit. 100%. Right? But you could say I manufactured that leverage because yes. I took the running back and the quarterback. And as it turns out, right, Jones, I believe, was and running it did for hit. a fair amount it of did. those such a it did yeah. hit. It's just you didn't need it because you had the fucking nuts everywhere. <laughs> well, well, not Mike Evans. I didn't actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's more like what you're talking about with you can manufacture the leverage if you take the running back and the quarterback. Um, and I think taking the running back and the quarterback, even if it's like more on the more expensive side, you know, is now I guess do we have any real examples of that? But like, OK, I would say. Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson. I draft them together a fair amount. Yeah. I'm, that's I'm a really totally good one. fine with that. And a lot of people would be like, that's so, like that. You just don't get what you're doing. Like Anthony Richardson's going to steal all the, all the rushing touchdowns, you know? So, so Taylor's not going to be, he's going to limit Taylor's receiving upside. And then, you know, if Richardson hits, it's because he rushes for a bunch of touchdowns. And so what's yep. the point you you basically just waste your first round pick, just bet on Richardson. Um, but m- my thing is, if we thought the Colts were going to be good, Jonathan Taylor would not be going in like the late second round or the mid second round. Correct. He's Jonathan Taylor. Bijan right? goes we- in the first. I Lude, I love Bijan. He's an amazing prospect. He's going to be good on the Falcons and everything like that. But like Bijan's going in the first round. Jonathan Taylor, the former 101, you know, yeah. or top three pick in fantasy, is going late second. And I don't really know the difference <laughs> between the two. Really, he's the, he's probably the best breakaway runner in the NFL. He's 24 years old. We have no age related concerns with him at all. Uh, Prime of his career. And the questions are basically, are the Colts going to be good? Are the Colts going to be able to support scoring? Yep. And if Richardson hits, it's because the Colts are good, right? If he, if he hits the Colts, like by (laughs) he's why. Yeah. Yeah. By definition are good. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He makes them good. So to me, I'm like, Colts are good. Right. If I draft Taylor, the Colts are good. So I'm also interested in Love drafting it. Richardson because the Colts are good. So that, to me, I'm like, this is easy. It's not. I don't have to get in the weeds of, oh, what if the touch, you know, the touchdowns, how are the touchdowns distributed? Like, I don't know that. To me, that kind of overcomplicates it. Like, yes, I could run bad with the touchdowns where, you know, Taylor scores one and only has 80 rushing yards in week 16 and Richardson runs for one throws for one and doesn't have a big week in the team's dead. But like if the touchdowns are cannibalized, but cannibalized to where Taylor runs for three, one week. Sweet. Richardson's yeah. like a going in. I'm taking him in the nineties, late nineties, even in the hundreds. Now he's getting into the hundreds now. Yeah. Yeah. So, Oh no, my late ninth round pick at quarterback didn't hit my <laughs> lineup. Oh yeah. God! How could I possibly survive? That I'll was be, Tom I'll Brady totally last fine. year, by the way. On the team that won was that was Tom Brady was never hitting your goddamn lineup la- last year, and then poof, you know, it yeah. happened in the, uh, week seventeen. Yeah. So I just, you know, I think like simplifying it a little bit and saying I'm just making a bet on the offense. You know, even with the more expensive guys, I think is still okay. I, there are probably points to where it wouldn't work, right? If Let's say Desmond Ritter, and this is hilarious to think, but let's say Desmond Ritter was a third round pick. Okay. <laughs> if I was taking Bijan first round, Desmond Ritter third round, Drake London fourth round, Kyle Pitts late fifth round, probably bad. That seems like it's that's probably too too much. But you know, that's like I ahead of that, I probably am not really drawing a line right now. And 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 it- why you say that it that it's bad to make that clear for everyone is that <clears throat> the cost is obviously important. We, I think most people, if you're listening to this, you have an understanding of kind of ADP and, and what that means and, and why cost is important. But why cost is important in terms of over-investing in a stack is because, not because like it's necessarily 100% even wrong in spending a bunch of picks on the same offense. It is that when we're trying to navigate through this, four, there's four rounds of this of these contests, right? The regular season and three three playoff rounds. You need enough juice, weekly juice from your entire lineup because you inherently just drafted multiple guys who are not going to hit your lineup every week. It's borderline impossible, right, for 
four or five guys from the same offense. I, I, about a, a, about as big of a certainty as there is in a game that's nothing but uncertainty is that all of those guys are not going to hit your lineup consistently at least and probably will only happen maybe in a good outcome a couple times a year. So you have just said, I got, I'm drafting two guys, right? And this is just going to happen naturally in, a, in fantasy football. Guys are going to get hurt. Guys are going to suck, whatever. Liam won with uh, what Zach Wilson or Justin Fields when he didn't do shit as a rookie or something like that. The guy that won drafters fucking cumulative scoring over 17 weeks had Zach Wilson last year as his as his QB two, just absolute insanity. But you just said two guys are not going to make my line. So now I'm down to 16. Right. For every single week, the cheaper you make those guys, the lower your projection gets, the lower chances you have. Right. You need. Like a fuck, you need serious injuries to happen to like get some contingent value for your late round guys. And then your opponents just have those guys too, right? Unless it's like Eli Mitchell or CPAT two years ago. So right, right. you just don't have enough juice in your lineup to make up for the fact that you just said, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm punting off a couple of my spots. Now, if you do it smartly, we just outlined why it might make sense. Maybe they do all hit your lineup. Maybe you're building in that manufactured leverage. There are ways to do it. It's just, it, it's that delicate balancing act that's really, that's, that's honestly really hard, but I think it's the right path to figure out how to how to tight, do that tightrope walk. I, I've done, and maybe you think this is this is bad, given that, you know, we just kind of uh, outlined how tough it is for those guys to all hit together. But the fact that Ritter isn't, um, you know, in the third round, he's in the last round, makes you know, betting on the Falcons more appealing. I also don't really care if I have Ritter. I've done in the hundred percent um five in a five five five, which isn't quite as you know easy to advance in as the Bulldog, but it's not best ball mania. Um I believe that's what it was in. I did the I did a Bijan London pits, which is definitely thin, but like <laughs> I get tight end eligibility with pits. And right. you know I get I get you know potentially I hit on one of the running backs you have to have this year in B. John Robinson. And then, you know, maybe London is a little more inconsistent because Pitts is really good, but I, you know, I'm still getting like a fourth, fifth round. I guess probably also comp. He goes so much though. later there. I, I don't know when I took him, but anyway, also very con the, the, the concentration is a, <clears throat> an important variable though, too. We've talked about the Eagles. It's like, I mean, I like Dallas Goddard fine, but Dallas Goddard's like a, 15 to 18% target share. I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't remember what it was last year, but it wasn't all that high actually. Cause it was, it's AJ Brown and Devonta Smith. Like we tried to come up, we tried to pipe dream about Quez and, and Zach Pascal and these guys as being like, Oh, this, we can toss this guy in the late round. None of that shit mattered. It was Jalen hurts, AJ Brown, Devonta Smith with a sprinkle of Dallas Goddard. So when it's that concentrated, it is easier for a those guys to just both have good seasons but b for them to hit your lineup at the same time or or right like you said the manufactured leverage comes into play because it's so concentrated that like some unless they get blanked on offense someone's doing something and it's there's only like three guys that it could be and that's what i, I like about the falcons plus like you said if you want ritter a you don't have to do it similar to how the the, the commanders thing you don't no, nothing says you have to draft that quarterback. The commanders is a better way to go because they profile as a potential Seahawks like offense where it's two dudes, it's two guys. So I can get the whole offense. If I have McLaurin, the whole passing offense, if I have McLaurin and I have Dotson, right? Mm -hmm. Like Logan Thomas isn't even being drafted. They're talking about using the tight end a little bit, but I'm a I little, I'm, I'm skeptical, right? I know. I, I I take him, but um uh uh that will be adjusted when camp comes around if if I get the, the hint of of uh, oh my god, this guy's dust or it's Cole Turner yeah. time or something like that. And then Curtis Samuel, you know, I think is totally draftable, but he wasn't as impressive last year. If Dotson takes a second year leap and pays off his ADP, I think Samuel could be in a little bit tougher shape. He could kind of go to like a poor man's Tyler Boyd is you have the two yeah. guys emerging, right? So that's kind of the the hope there. And when you do those two stack together, tack on Hal if you want, you don't have to though, because you're getting the offense. The bet is you're I that's another mm -hmm. offense I just got. I just scooped another offense. I made a simple bet that the commanders score more points than people expect this year. And 
in that case, it doesn't cost you like that much to do it. And it's also in a range of drafts where I really want to be drafting wide receivers. If I'm going, you know, late fourth round McLaurin, early seventh round Dotson. I mean, I, I love that. I've done that. I've done that a fair amount. I love, I, I love it too. And that's another thing about the, just this whole stacking conversation is that we obviously always want to be cognizant of like what you just said. Uh, and what we talked about with the running backs too, right? The Penny, Damian Harris, and those kinds of things. It's all caveated by like making sure you're understanding the whole best ball landscape, the ADP pop, right? We always talk about like this pocket of the draft or, you know, people use dead zones and all that kind of stuff. But like you said, from the late third to uh, eighth, ninth round, seventh, for sure, probably eighth round. We get to, I always just keep using the Rashad Bate, Rashad Bateman is like, you know, the, although the I would say line. with this cortisone thing, I'm, I'm not particularly worried about it after looking into it more, but I think the market said he's, he's with Sutton now. He's not a part of the crew. I think, yeah, I'm not even sure who the I, last guy is anymore. Is it Brandon Cooks, maybe? Cooks. Yeah. 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 Cooks. Yeah. Uh, I need to, anyway, everybody gets the point. There's, you Quentin can Johnson. all draw your, your, your There's own line. Huge. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere around that in the 80s of ADP they're in the eighties of ADP you pick your personal line, whether it is Bateman, Zay flowers, Sutton, um, yeah, cooks, Quentin Johnston, et cetera. There's a group there because, and why I say that is because after them is, I mean, I love JMO, but I love JMO, but he's suspended for six, six weeks. So we obviously can't quite include him. If he were not suspended, a, he'd probably go in front of these guys, but like he would be in this, in this mix. He is suspended though. Michael Tom the court Michael Thomas oh you know <laughs> people are scared of Calvin Ridley Michael Thomas hasn't played in the same amount of time as Calvin Ridley and he's much older uh, I don't want to say much but he is I, older I draft some Michael Thomas sometimes I know I I literally just drafted him uh last night um because I'm very into the Saints but there's Michael Thomas I mean Cortland Sutton also hasn't done shit in a long time right Juju Alan Lazard Jacoby Myers, Tyler, Bo- like we just I tossed Tyler Boyd in, in the- I know I Tyler draft all Boyd, these guys. Yeah. Some you get forced into it. Sky because- Moore, I draft now again. I'm back. Yeah, d- yeah, we're gonna get Head a round. Sky Moore steam part two is in the in the midst of happening I'm here. Sorry. He's separating I'm sorry from all. I'm drafting him. He's separating from all the. He's gonna pass Tony in a. Few, <laughs> he's getting you know, athletic. He's the cover weeks. boy of athletic stories. I, what am I supposed uh, to do? Fucking unsubscribe from the athletic apparently, <laughs> so that we can stop doing this <laughs> Sky Moore bit, but. But the point is, like you said, these things can fall into place where it's like, like if you didn't want to do AJ Brown, Devonta Smith, you're like, well, look at these second round running backs, <laughs> Tony Bollard, Nick Chubb. You talk about JT, Saquon yeah. Barkley, Ramondre, yeah. Brees Hall. Like maybe I don't want to invest in all of the Eagles offense because the alternatives are like guys that used to be like top five picks in fantasy. Like Tony Pollard, Nick Chubb would have been top five picks five years ago in fantasy. Now you can get them in the late second round, right? JT was the one one Nothing has changed except the offense probably has more upside. <laughs> That's downside too, but nothing has changed. Now he goes in the late second. Those things are important. The dots and McLaurin thing is like, I, I, we all have running backs around. I really like JK Dobbins again this year. But like these fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth round running backs, like, I don't know if I don't have them, it seems fine. But again, because then look, 10th round, there's Damian Harris, there's Rashad Penny, there's Antonio Gibson, there's all these guys. You navigate these pockets of the draft and you can combine these stacking things and be like, well, I'm in this spot. Let's just stack up Washington. Whether I take Howell or or Brissett or whatever, who cares? Seattle. Want to stack up Seattle? Do it whenever the hell you want. DK Metcalf's always freely available after, you know, uh, the early tiers of wide receivers. Lock it in JSN. Get them whenever you want. Gino, get him whenever you want. Want to stack them up? Do you need Gino? Don't have to do it if you don't want Gino, right? Maybe you took an elite. You took Hertz. You don't need Gino, but you can still stack the Seahawks, right? right? I did it last year. Failed miserably, but did it last year with Pittsburgh. I don't want Big Ben. There's Big Ben has no use on my on my fantasy teams, but that doesn't mean Deontay and Pickens. And these guys can't eat, right? They can catch a bunch of Friar Muth. They can catch a bunch of passes. So you can combine all these different things to put them into this stacking thing. And I think that's part of what is also important. It's not just like, oh, just go stack the Eagles, dummy. Go stack the Bills. Like, it's, you have to kind of combine all this stuff. Yeah, and I mean, and the other thing I would say about stacking is I don't go into drafts saying I'm going to stack 
this team, right? Like yep. m- maybe if I'm looking at my exposure, I'm like, I right, no, whatever. Maybe I would sort of say, if it falls to me, even close to falling to me, I'm going to try to get this done. But, um, you know, it, it depends kind of where things land and, uh, you know, how the draft's going along. And then no matter who I've taken, I do want to start building in stacks around who I've taken or who I'm going to take, you know, that you can, you can also be aware of, you know, if you don't have a tight end through the end of, uh, you know, round six, Goddard's off the board already, right? You're, you're kind of in the later round seven range. I will sometimes take Waller and, you know, now all of a sudden I've got myself a Giants Ram stack around and I've only taken one player, but I already know like I can, I can get Daniel Jones if I want, if I don't get Daniel Jones. So what I already have my giant, I can easily tackle on Rams. I can go get Van Jefferson, Stafford, tackle on two, two, tackle on Puka, do whatever you want. I have actually yet to tackle on Puka, but uh, people like Puka. So I'll give them a little, little shout. I'm taking two. I took a little bit of Puka. The very first like blurb we got or whatever. I was like, Oh, I'll sprinkle some, some, some puka in whatever who they're yeah, sure. 18th round 18th round wide receiver open depth chart whatever Higby then also P- is free uh totally free then puka is like you know the, the second coming of sky more the puka's going like i i immediately after the first couple blurbs it's like i'm seeing like 16th round puka like what the fuck just happened like all of a sudden he went from a drafted in like one percent of drafts to people are like making him a priority at pick 175 or whatever so then now i'm i'm like back on two 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 now two two is getting the 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 hype now like i think just today yeah he just got a blurb today yeah but anyway i've been on two two the whole time welcome back point uh, point being dude i i drafted some two two last year and I can't. This is a hundred percent a leak in my game. I he was so good in college. He was good, like so good, like dominant. I, and I don't mean like oh he caught a bunch of long touchdowns or whatever. Like I'm not talking. This is this wasn't MVS. This was like forty percent target share. <laughs> like the the most dominant player in the ACC. He's like he an Elijah literally... Moore level prospect, but just too small. He was just he's, crazy he's, he's, small. So it was so hard for me to separate. And like I, I talked about this, I, college football DFS might be my favorite form of, of DFS. And like Tutu was like an autoplay and Louisville's defense. Louisville was like the Detroit Lions. And Tutu was like when Amon Ra went on that run at the end of the year. Like it was literally, you just played him and they have Malik Cunningham was their former quarterback who's also a dual, dual threat quarterback. It was like if Louisville was on a d- college football DFS slate, you were like, Okay, I'm playing Malik Cunningham and I'm stacking him with two two, and I'm playing at least another dude on the other side, maybe two, because Louisville's defense is so so fucking bad. It was like autoplay, and so you like you watch a lot, and I'm like, he's just like awesome. It's just God made him 150 pounds. If he were 175 pounds, like he would be like, I mean, he he would have been a first round pick. He would have been uh, an elite elite prospect. And so um, I've really had a hard time like detaching myself from how good I think two two is with the weight with the weight issues i can't wrap my or the just size issues i mean with for me tutu is like just put him out there because he looked good last year he was good last year yeah so if i if there's reports that like no no they're gonna play tutu then i'm in that's all i need just he's going to see the field i'm in i think he's good so I, i like getting him late and he helps knowing that you can get tutu or probably puka right if tutu starts to get hype then puka will fall away but there's a Rams wide receiver just like sitting there in the last rounds for you. Van Jefferson's moved up because ETR uh, moves the market on all these guys. But, um, you know, he's Thank still God. not like super Thank expensive. Thank God they do the guys like Van Jefferson that I don't give a fuck about to, to move. Oh, I was him drafted. I, him. I know. I mean, I drafted him some too, but like the fact that he moves up, I'm not like, God damn it. You know, know. like it, it is like Jalen. Jalen Warren went from like pick 170 to like he's going to be in like the 110s. So like it, this is a meteoric rise, and I'm not happy about that because I, I want to yeah. draft Jalen Warren. Van Jefferson moving up is like whatever. I'll just draft two two. If I don't have Van, I think I'll be okay. Yeah. The other thing I'll say about stacking, um, it, you know, as you're kind of thinking through it as the draft goes on, one of the reasons I really like it. This is one of the reasons I like Week 17 correlation as well is that it forces you to draft players who you normally aren't going to draft, and Look, I don't want to just – I had a friend who was asking me about – he plays fantasy but doesn't really play best ball, and he was sort of saying, like, 
you know, if you're drafting a bunch of teams this year, like, are you just trying to like cover like every player? And at that point, aren't you just sort of giving away like edge? You know what I mean? Like if you're, if you have the guys you like, shouldn't you just draft them? And if you're just drafting them, like how many teams do you really need to do? You know, fair question. Like, right. But the way I think about it is I'm going to, I want to draft as many really smartly constructed teams, teams that make, bets on specific offenses teams that are internally consistent you know they're they're betting on specific outcomes and they're built so that if certain outcomes occur they're going to vault to the top of the standings they're going to advance more easily through the Mm -hmm. playoff rounds etc if i have any odell beckham teams this year which i actually do even though i don't like taking them i want them as part of lamar jackson teams i want them correlated with lamar jackson has an absolutely insane season the type of season that powers odell beckham to a comeback you know if i have any dalton kincaid teams which i now have a few of he's it's because he's falling past adp is a big part with kincaid because i think kincaid's wildly overpriced but uh he's stacked with josh allen like i'm not taking uns so it's like i am willing to full fade a guy but if that guy is usually past ADP and then I have him stacked at least if I take him there and I happen to be wrong on that player, that player has an amazing season. He's helping that team more than just any, uh, like any regular old team. It's that I've at least now kind of harnessed that, that hit that I have less of than everyone else, Mm -hmm. but I have it on a team that is going to make the most of it. So that's why I think, it's not just about kind of spreading out your exposures or, you know, taking smaller stands. It's that on the times that you do go away from your convictions on these player takes, you're getting more for when the conviction was wrong and this player ends up being a hit. Kincaid is a really good example of that, actually. Um, this And this is something that I've definitely tried to be cognizant of because, at, go, again, going back to what I was talking about earlier, that, I, I am probably like a player take guy at my core, but I've really had to force myself out of being too, too stark with it. Not because I think that's wrong. That's, that's a discussion for another day about, you know, exposures and how do you handle your player takes and stuff. But I have tried to think through, even if I Dalton Kincaid, even if I dislike this player at, at this cost, if I'm wrong, what does that mean? What happens when I'm when I'm wrong, right? We talked about I just talked about Van Jefferson. Like if I'm wrong about and like I said, I was actually drafting Van. I'm I'm neutral to to Van Jeff- Jefferson. He's fine. But like let's say I'm like, I'm fuck that. I'm not drafting any Van Jefferson. He sucked. He can't win me anything. He might not even start. Puka's the guy, right? It's gonna be Puka and Tutu and Cooper Cup. If I'm wrong, what happens? Nothing. Not nothing like mm-hmm. it, 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 like uh, you know okay he catches a couple more touchdowns than I thought like ah oh, darn you know he's high thought, enough to where it doesn't hurt that much Juju would goes, be another example of like yes. Juju's not going to bury me what I have a good advance right. rate I might be like oh, I should have I should have been more open minded because he had like a you know a twenty percent advance rate but those are the those are the losses like I it's fine like if I, I'll eat that L and it doesn't kill me I can still win these tournaments. If I didn't yeah. draft much Van Jefferson, Dalton Kincaid, especially when we start to factor in a falling price, like you said, past ADP, I think the market has generally soured on him a little bit. Um, most smart people have come out and said it took him long. He has enough. a he has a t- he has a tough path to like a really fantasy friendly kind of full time role. But as the price falls, like, what if we're all wrong about Dalton Kincaid? What if he what if he does just usurp Dawson Knox? He's, you know, running whatever percentage of the routes we want to call from from the Bills. We've outlined for multiple years now part of why Gabe Davis got so much steam last year was besides Stefan Diggs, there is no one to get targets in Buffalo. Buffalo Diggs is now aging and uh, his diva tendencies are apparently coming coming back out here this this offseason. And Gabe Davis has basically proven to just be Gabe Davis, right? Spike week guy, never going to generate a monster target share. They didn't bring anybody else in. Um, so what if Kincaid is just fucking Travis Kelsey, right? I mean, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but what if first round pick talented wide receiver? Well, that probably means him and people Josh are going to tell, but, but Pitts is the actual example. I, I, thousand I, yards I, as a rookie. 
good. This, this, very true. Pitts, 100%. If people are like, this dude sucks, the Falcons suck, blah, blah, blah. What if Pitts really is the transcendent player that some people believe he can be? No, sorry. I mean, Kincaid having Pitts rookie season. Oh, having Pitts. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Uh, Pitts is actually another example. <laughs> Probably, actually. If Pitts is the best receiving tight end of of all time, what does that mean? Well, Ritter's probably going to be It means okay. my portfolio looks pretty good right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. It means the Falcons are probably pretty good. Ritter's probably pretty good. Whatever. But Kincaid is that. Like, if we're all wrong, and this first-round tight end is just awesome, because he's a first-round pick, he's a good receiver or whatever, the Bills' offense is going to be even better. <laughs> because it's been awesome with Dawson Knox. It's just a dude, basically, at, at tight end. And so, like you said, thinking through that, it's like, well, I want my Kincaid bet to be on the right kind of teams that say when Kincaid is a star, he, this team is going to win the whole goddamn tournament, right? That's right. why, even though it's become a pretty popular thing to do at the four or five turn, it's why Justin Fields and DJ Moore is something I don't want to be underweight on um, and and uh, say whatever you want about the Bears situation. We don't need to go into the past volume stuff again, but the ceiling outcome on Justin Fields and DJ Moore, like breaking out together almost is like- uh, Not almost. Is- like that's that's what would happen. Justin right. Fields becomes a star as a passer. In those scenarios, like DJ Moore, at, and and the reverse is like even more true. Like if DJ Moore crushes a late fourth round ADP, I want Fields. Yes, you want Fields on that team, right? But not every stack is like that. It is there are these certain things that you have to think through, like 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 the Bucks. I take some Godwin and Evans. I was taking them a little bit more early. I kind of soured a little bit on them. Uh, mainly just uh there's a lot of uh, there's a, just a lot of receivers in that range and like none of them have baker mayfield and Kyle Trask as their quarterback so i feel like kind of like the other guys but it there's not a situation where it's like oh yeah these two ceilings are correlated man mike evans and baker mayfield right like what if baker bounce i guess technically like what if baker bounces back but like let's be realistic that's not something that's really even in the range of outcomes versus these other ones when i'm stacking that like like you said my Kincaid teams are going to be smartly built. Whereas like yeah, my Mike yeah. Evans teams is just like, I don't know. He's the best receiver available here. I'm going to mix yeah, Mike Evans. Exactly. I don't really care. I'll mix in Mike Evans. I probably should mix in Mike Evans actually more than I do. I, th- I probably, like, I-, I view Godwin and Evans as like fairly similar bets actually, which I'm awful on the market in. I think the market strongly prefers Godwin, but I end yeah. up with more. I have, I'm probably even the discrepancy is bigger there. This is maybe one thing we should talk about in the future. Like, getting your exposures the way you want them can be tough because the way that the market kind of pushes you certain really hard. Yeah. So I, I'd rather be overweight Evans and underweight Godwin, but it's the reverse for me right now. Um, but, you know, those guys are not ones where I'm, I don't even really like taking them together. That's one of the few ones that I don't really take together. Cause I, I feel like they're like, I would like for, they're, they're most positively correlated if like one of them gets traded, mm-hmm. I think, you know? I think that's uh, the, probably the reason to take them to get, that would be the, the main reason, reason yeah. is Evans yeah. gets shipped to Buffalo or whatever. They don't have super tradable contracts though. And, you know, with Hopkins still sitting out there and they could, it doesn't, I don't know, maybe Godwin would be the, the guy that people got more excited to trade for, but he's, I think, harder to trade. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm not taking a ton of those guys together and, I don't feel like I need to bet on, you know, them to be tied to their quarterback because, we, yeah, we want to be looking at the ones where it's actually realistic, where it's like we're already kind of as a collective making a a bet on Fields as a potential big time breakout candidate. How does it happen? You know, same as uh, Josh Allen, like he's going very expensively. So what's one of the ways where that is like ends up looking cheap? I mean, one of the ways would be if Kincaid's a superstar. I don't think mm-hmm. that all that likely. That's why I don't pair them all, you know, that frequently. But you know, it's uh, it's definitely possible. Uh, Odo Beckham is a, is maybe an even better example of that. Like, I have taken Lamar Jackson, Rashad Bateman, Say Flowers, and Odo Beckham. Mm-hmm. I've done the the full triple stack of the wide receivers. I haven't gotten Andrews there. If I had Andrews, I would probably just skip Beckham. But I'm like, you know what? Beckham's cheap enough in a range of the draft where there's really like no other wide receivers to where like if he broke out of this range, then it would actually be like quite helpful for this particular team, the way it's constructed, because it'll be sort of a contrarian, you know, structure um, to be and allows me to maybe get more running back help early or whatever. 
kind of or bails me out from having gone running back early. Um, and if Lamar Lamar does actually strike me as the type of quarterback that could support a you know let's say two receivers on the seven eight turn and a guy in like the you know the end of the eleventh is probably where I'd be taking Beckham. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's certainly not taking at the end of the ninth. So, <laughs> you know, but in that kind of, in that kind of range. So that's like, it's not that expensive. If Lamar pays off an early fourth round or late third round ADP, they have more passing volume. They actually lean into him as a passer. He still runs a bunch, you know, maybe Andrews misses some time. Uh, I can I can see it right and mm-hmm. and I do not like drafting Odo Beckham. I don't really like drafting Zay Flowers at his price. I'm still in on Bateman, but I'm willing to take in that case like two wide receivers. So I don't feel that good about. But at least the team is like very internally consistent. It's it's making a clear bet that Lamar breaks out in a huge way as a passer this season on more volume. I love that. And just quickly, the merry-go-round of Ravens wide receiver ADP has been rather humorous to watch this offseason. It started, and I I, I don't know about uh, DraftKings or Drafters, so I apologize. I've been drafting on Underdog for the last week or so. Shout out to them with the, what was it called? The the Chihuahua and stuff. Some of these contests are really fun. Uh, I like some of these contests to like play around with stuff uh experiment with different things some of the things that we're talking about here like i have teams like you just outlined lamar and all the wide receivers and uh you know maybe i have uh tyreek and waddle on that and we're really having fun you know with that week 17 the teams i i know i've done that i don't think i've done that best ball mania i've done it in the puppy i have in the puppy too i've got some teams like that i've done a lot of lamar stuff in the puppy too yeah i love I, i lamar is the guy that again taking into account like the landscape and stuff. A, I think the Ravens are, we talked about fields and the bears, but I think the Ravens are like the cleanest bet when you like factor in everything, the the prices and the pockets where all these guys go is like so smooth, man. Like you could, you could realistically draft like every Raven basically. And they would probably fall in a spot where you're like, yeah, I could make a case. They're the best guy on the board or, like we just talked about how Bateman and kind of Zay Flowers could be perceived as a cutoff at wide receiver, a drop right there. They're the the line in the sand where you, you really don't want anybody after them and everybody before them is all kind of bunched together. Mark Andrews goes after basically other than Brees, he goes after like all the elite running backs and all the elite wide receivers and all the elite quarterbacks essentially besides Lamar, I guess. Lamar goes after all those guys in this range the late third right from like Ridley and those guys down to freaking I don't know, Christian Kirk is like 20 wide receivers that I don't know there. Yeah. I just throw my hands up every draft and like <laughs> mix them around. So like, again, they go in these pockets where it's like JK Dobbins goes in the late fifties or something, which again is this big wide tier in the whole draft. Odell goes in the wide receiver dead, dead zone where you don't the juju zone where you don't want anybody. It's like, Every the Raven stacks fall together so clean. And so that's a thing where it's like, if I'm not forcing it like the Eagles one, like you, you talked about earlier, why you know it, it may be tough to force yourself to even try for the Eagle stack. The Raven stack, you don't have to try. It just happens, man. Like those guys are the best player on the board a lot of the times when you just come up like constantly. And those are the ones where it's like, yeah, I'm just gonna be overweight that. A, I like them. I think the upside bet with Munkin in town and, and the new weapons in town and everything is, is smooth. It, it's so easy to see this being a big hit, but also it's like, it's kind of like a small loss. Like, I don't know, other than Lamar getting hurt again, I, I, I don't really see how you lose that much on these guys at, at these prices. So just everything comes together. And that's another, again, important part about all this is like, I don't have a lot of Eagle stacks because of other factors. It has nothing to do with the Eagles. It's other factors. I have a lot of Raven stacks. Of course, I like the Ravens, but it has a lot to do with all this other shit too. Price and pockets of the draft and all that. For sure. Yeah. I also think like understanding how the stacks come together and getting familiar with how those stacks come together. Like you're, you're talking through the Ravens one. It's like a really easy one to get your head around because you can do it with Andrews if you're really lucky right now, but it's hard. Um, but then you the have receivers. Yeah. Or you have to reach, which you know I, I don't love to do, but I am mean, going to do it a little bit because I want to have like I like I've I want to have 
I want to have Tyreek, Lamar, okay. and Andrew. Like, I want to have teams yeah. that have that. I want to have – I've done it with, like, Jefferson. It's like everybody – that's yeah, who I've done it with. Yeah. More likely do it with Tyreek. But like, I want to have Justin Jefferson with a Lamar Andrews stack. Like, I don't want to have zero of that, those three players together. And you won't get it unless you do it at the two, three turn. So uh, I'm just going to do it a few times. Not anything crazy, though. Yeah. I've done it a fair amount at the two, three turn in the puppy, probably like, I don't know, four times or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, that that's another thing, right? If you're going to do stuff like reaching for stacks, stacks, I would do it in tournaments that are limited in the time don't right because it it might be the case that all these quarterbacks fall and as a late third round drafter i know that i have a like a realistic shot at jalen hurts in any given draft and i've got aj brown right so that means i'm much less likely to just be the guy who scoops up a, a falling lamar jackson lamar jackson might settle into the fourth and so all of a sudden getting andrews jackson in three, four might be very common. It, it, it could August. become very common. Yeah. in in August and uh, someone might say a, a galaxy brain person like myself might say, well, really it's just like a, a player combination thing, right? You, instead of taking them at the two, three turn with Justin Jefferson, you're going to take them at the three, four turn with CD lamb and Amon Ra St. Brown. It's really just kind of like a two V two game that you're playing, but the, you can always go back and reach on them. Right in August, if you want them with Justin Great Jefferson, point. you can you can do that in August too. Now it's a bigger reach, but who gives a fuck? It doesn't. It, it really doesn't matter. If you're going to reach, you're going to reach. It doesn't really matter uh, if they're three, four turn picks or mid third round. Right now they're like mid third round picks. It's not. There's no difference. You can always go back and get those other player combinations, but you you can't if you take them now. Right, you can't have that back. You don't get that back, but you can always go do it again later. It's kind of the inverse of. Uh, people will say, get really like <laughs> shout out to the people in, in the spike week discord. People have probably brought it up in your discord as well. Like, Oh my God, I never get the one Oh two. They're like, I, I, I want to have Jamar chase, but I just, I've gotten the one Oh two once out of 25 drafts or whatever they're, I'm running so bad. And they're like, should I take Jamar chase one Oh one? I'm like, you are never going to be able to get those Justin Jefferson teams back. If you do not right. take him at the one Oh one, this is the inverse of that. You can always go back and reach on these to adjust. If you like, I don't have enough Lamar Andrews. I don't have any with Justin Jefferson. You can do that whenever you want, but you cannot go back and retroactively, right? Oh shit. I took chase one one The next thing you know, you get the one Oh two, like eight drafts in a row. Yep. And now you're overweight chase and underweight Jefferson. Like, you know, it's just li- little things um, to take into account when you're drafting tons of teams, you know, like I think it's a great point. People are. Yeah. I love that. But in these time limit tournaments, you know, taking them at the two, three turn, you know, the, it's a snapshot. No one's going to get the, you know, we're just not going to see like four twelve Lamar in, in any of these puppies or, you know, maybe one really, really weird one, but, but that's not <laughs> going to be a uh, common ADP. Um, but with, with a stack like Lamar, like if you are really familiar with the way this and, you know, it does require drafting a, at least somewhat frequently because these things always kind of are shifting around. These are, we're building houses on sand here. But it's like, uh, for right now, you know that there's a good chance that you can get Bateman and Zay Flowers on the Mm 7-8. And, you know, you probably can get Odell. I would be kind of pushing Odell, especially if I have both those guys. Even one of those guys, I might push Odell. But if you feel better about Odell than I do, you know you can get him pretty easily in in a range of the draft where there's not a ton of reason to want to take wide receivers generally. It opens up running back picks earlier, right? You can yeah. take – Dobbins is a guy that I take a lot. That's another – we talk about the running back. I take a lot of Dobbins with Lamar Jackson because mm-hmm. he comes back. Not only does Dobbins stack with the Ravens, and I'm just betting on the Ravens to be awesome, the Ravens to return to a couple years ago where it's like they're blowing out teams, kind of an Eagles-like Ravens run this year. Lamar's healthy, under contract, new receivers, new OC, and we're all sitting there like – how were why were we doubting Lamar? He has the highest upside. He's the one who scored the most points of any of these quarterbacks. He's got weapons. They're gonna they told us they're gonna throw more. He's under contract. He's happy. He's been there for months. Like he's had a chance to work out with these guys. Blah, 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 blah. We're, you know, I, I just think the upside cases on this stack are are pretty obvious. And I like so I like tacking on the running back. I like I'll tack on Gus Edwards to the this stuff too. But to this point, 
in the cases where I'm tacking on Dobbins, it's not just that I'm betting on the Ravens. It's that I'm taking a running back in a range of the draft where I don't tend to take a ton of running backs generally. So I'm getting kind of a, a little bit of different texture to my drafts, mm -hmm. taking a running back there. I could also mix in a running back in the late first or the early second. If I've, if I kind of basically have penciled in maybe Lamar for the third or, or whatever, it certainly makes things easier for me. If I've already done an early running back, that's one detour. Lamar's two detours, right? But then I can maybe even get away with a third running back detour because I'm thinking that I can take wide receivers in seven and eight. So that mm -hmm. takes me to my fifth wide receiver through eight rounds very easily. It's a stacked wide receiver with my quarterback. It's also a rookie, you know, assuming you go Bateman Flowers, a rookie is that wide receiver five is kind of interesting because I'm betting on that. I've got depth at the position now, and I'm betting on someone to come on as the season goes on. Uh, so I think that's kind of an interesting way to play a wide receiver five in general. So just like it, it's like one of those things where if you're doing the if you know kind of how the Lamar Jackson stack with the receivers tends to go, it's a little different if you do it with Andrews, but with the receivers, what does it unlock in other rounds of the draft? You know, that seven, eight wide receiver double tap unlocks running backs before round seven a little bit more easily. It's it's such a perfect point because I think it's easy for us to and and to a certain extent, everyone does this and everyone should when we say the phrase, like, let the draft come to me. To, to a certain extent, that's just how a fucking snake draft works, right? You don't get to pick, yeah. you know, it's not it, like it, it has you don't to come bid to in. Uh, yeah, yeah, like for, for, you don't 12, get. Yeah, yeah, exactly. we're on the 202 like, now, so pipe down. Right, right. Exactly. So, like, technically, yes, everyone is letting the draft come come to them. But at, what I what I think the difference is is that everyone draft not everyone the most of our opponents draft what I would call front to back. Right. I got my first round pick. Okay, I took AJ Brown. Okay, who's up? Who, who's who's available in the second round? Uh, oh, oh, look. Uh, Eckler fell past ADP. Boom, taking him. Third round. Uh, okay, DK Metcalf's the top guy on the board. Taking him. Whatever. And then, like, you get to the eighth round, and you're you're like, oh, you're looking at the queue. Oh, okay. Now I'm gonna do this. Now I'm gonna do that because I drafted those first four, five, six guys. I like to. Of course, you have to do that to a certain extent. Like I said, every, it's a snake draft. It has to kind of come to you. But I like to think about it how you did, which is more like back to front, right? I like you said. Uh, I I know Lamar where Lamar goes. And then because I know where Lamar goes, like you said, it allows me to not only think about my first two picks, it allows me to think about my next several picks thereafter because of what the Ravens offer with Zay Flowers and Rashad Bateman, right? Not every offense is like this, but uh, we you, you mentioned before, uh, uh, which is going to also partially segue into another kind of subject or question I want to ask, but you mentioned like the Rams and the Giants, frankly, both sides of that game. Uh, is one I need to that is one I'm being cognizant of of like I don't think my exposure is high enough to is high enough to that to that game and it makes no sense because everyone is free besides Saquon Barkley and and Cooper Cup and both offenses look pretty good both defenses don't look very good uh you know I it makes too much sense and yet I don't have as much exposure to it so that's one of those things where I'm dictating it but that's one of the examples of of sim not not the same thing as the Ravens, but like I know inherently I can get a giant or a ram whenever I want any position. Yeah, yeah. Literally any position. You want one of the Giants backup running backs? You want one of the Rams backup running backs? Sure, that's a fucking lottery. You know, you want to talk about Cam Akers is very affordable. You know, Akers is affordable. Waller is. We went from Waller at the two three turn to now Waller in a better situation probably at least for like volume and and upside now going in the 80s daniel jones i don't know what that guy's got to do he just crushed know, last year right? and he's and he uh, goes I... super <laughs> he goes super cheap but right i'm not saying we should love jalen hyatt but jalen hyatt is a won the freaking bolitnikoff and is a, a a spike week type uh receiver who's now gotten down into the 170s right paris campbell 2-2 van blah 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 everybody's free but like if you just go through your draft and you just say, okay, I took this guy in the third round. Now I'm going to take this guy in the fourth round. And you don't say, okay, you know what? I'm going to take Cooper Cup here. And then ah, I didn't get Saquon. Okay. That informs the fact that now there's Waller. There's um, all those Giants wide receivers that go literally outside the top 170. There's Daniel Jones. 
There's and then on the Ram side, right? There's Acres, there's Stafford, there's Higby, there's Tutu, there's all this. These are all late round. Van. Guys. Van. These are all late round guys. So now, what does that mean for my second through right? My second through seventh round picks. That means something different for them. And so I'm, but I'm planning from the back. Yeah. Right? Because the I'm, I, it's I started okay. Cup got Cup. Now I now I think about what does that mean, right? Same thing with the Ravens. What does it mean when I take Lamar here and I, I say I don't have Andrews? Well, that means I'm going to be looking at Zay and Bateman. So now I got three rounds in between here, right? Now exactly. what do I do? And that's those are more the rounds that I'm focused on because I like I love Brees Hall, right? If Brees Hall falls to the 311, I'm taking him, dude. I'm taking him. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if Lamar's there. So I, I haven't set up, you know, I'm not like so in on Lamar right now that I'm thinking about him, to be honest, in in rounds one or two. I'm I'm really not. But as soon as I take him. First of all, it, it definitely kind of bails me out a little bit if I did go. Let's say I went Bijan or Eckler, and then a and then a wide receiver. Definitely, and I could take Lamar. Out. It yeah, feels like yeah, I, I feel much better about the start because then I I, I know I'm going to be targeting three wide receivers no earlier than like the seven eleven, right? So I've got I'm going to be taking some more wide receivers. I only have one to that point, so I'm going to be taking a few more wide receivers. But not only do I feel better about my round one running back selection, I might throw in another one, you know, in between because I know I have that flexibility. If I don't have any to that point, I can go, man, I'm going to take two. I'm going to take a really, I'm going to take a falling value on, you know, someone that I don't normally draft, you know, mm-hmm. and that that's another thing I've tried to take advantage in those builds is like, I don't really love taking Alexander Madison right now or Damian <laughs> Pierce. I don't tend to take a lot of, you know, but if those guys fall, you know, I will. I will if um or or whatever. Oh, Aaron Jones is another guy, right? Aaron Jones is one of the guys because he falls. I'm we're talking like late fifth. So if he mm-hmm. falls, or maybe I'll throw him around the wrap and try to get him in the early sixth. Yep. On some of these Lamar teams. But taking those guys where I'm like, you know, I don't I don't hate Aaron Jones this year. I do, it's just it's just more that I need the wide receiver in that round. Yeah. But Lamar in a vac in a vacuum in most drafts, you need that wide receiver there. But because you took Lamar. You, it's not that you don't need the wide receiver there, but you have a wide receiver I that you know is coming. Yeah, you've got one coming. Yes, and the the Giants and the stat and the um, Rams one, I do that one a lot, and partly I do it because I don't like the late. I don't take Eric Gray. I don't take Matt Breida. Maybe that's a leak, but I don't. I don't take Kyron Williams. I don't take Zach and Zach Evans. I probably come in Gonna combination take taken. Gonna start. Taking I don't Sony. take Sony. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just. I'm not really. Not to say that I won't later, but I don't feel like I have clarity on them right now. So I'm just not really taking them. Yep. Okay. So I'm. What am I taking? Well, I like Hodgins. I like Slayton. I'll take Jalen Hyatt if he falls way past ADP, and he's actually he's fallen so much in ADP. I'm starting to to get more interested. I'll take Tutu. I'll take Van. You know, there's lots of pieces there that I'm willing to take. They are all wide receivers. So. 100%. That informs what I'm doing, right? If I've if I've set up, if I've got Cooper Cup and Darren Waller, right, and then I tack on Daniel Jones, I'm now going to push any wide wide receiver picks. I might go through, you know, into round 14 with only five wide receivers, you know, entering round 15 only five wide receivers because I know I'm tacking on wide receivers late. My late round picks are going to be mostly wide receivers, so why would I? Why would I box myself out by taking like a Sky Moore in the tenth round? That actually hurts my overall team plan. Like I know those late rounds are going to be easy to take those wide receivers later, and that's where you, if you if you do it this way, if you say okay, not that I know for a fact those wide receivers will be there, but there's a good chance I'm going to be because there's so many of them that I'm going to be taking some late round wide receivers on this build. I want to be in a position where. I go to the, you know, I'm on, I'm on the clock, and the guy that I want is sitting right at the top of queue. The mm-hmm. position, the the exact player that just fits this team, I want him to be sitting right at the top of the queue. And you achieve that in, you know, this Rams Giants example by passing on a sky more and, and taking a running back instead. You know, by passing on, you know, a wide receiver in the the twelfth round, right? You, you no, I'll grab Jalen Warren here because I, I actually I'm gonna get a running back and fill out my running back and feel really strong. Even if I, let's say I have four running backs at that point. So what? I'll take my fifth running back, get that taken care of. 
because this is a Giants Rams thing. And I know there's a bunch of wide receivers late. I'm not going to be taking late round flyers so much on running backs. I'm going to be spending them on correlated wide receiver uh, selections. I, I love that so much. And um, I was, it, it also kind of reminded me um, I wanted to look at my, some of my Cooper cup teams. And it's funny because um, I actually don't think I've, I mean, no one uh, spends more time thinking of thinking through <laughs> wasting their brain space, thinking through stupid galaxy brain best ball ideas um, than me and, and all the other sickos listening to this. But I, I think it was just like, partially subconsciously happening which is funny that we're talking about it now but with cooper cup teams what's happening a lot for me is this is a specifically uh this example of kind of back to front or knowing what is available to me that makes sense on a cooper cup team and drafting it accordingly so i have these i'll call them they were they're definitely zero rb builds for other people for me like i will sometimes take my my zero rb a little bit more extreme <clears throat> but I'm hammering the elite wide receivers, right? So I take Cooper Cup and I say, okay, like you said, I know what is available with those wide receivers later. I know that if I need Stafford, if I need Higby, I got those guys in my back pocket. But I know, I think my personal preference is there's that Waller Daniel Jones kind of combo available to me from, you know, Waller at 85 or whatever. And Daniel Jones at 100, 110, something like that is his ADP. Yeah. And I would love to get that pair because I have this superstar wide receiver that would give me elite quarterback upside, elite tight end upside. Right. And, and, that, and a and, superstar wide receiver, one of the advantages of superstar wide receiver is that they can basically be a whole offense. Yes. So in some ways they're like a perfect bring back. Exactly. And so then when I get this, right, the, the all this that's so perfectly, perfectly said, and you combine it with this rushing quarterback who we just saw get there last year as a rusher without really popping off to any to any of his of his wide receivers. They're fine, but nothing super special. And but now this elite tight end who the reason why that the, the Darren Waller bull case is that he's like the most target dominant tight end in the league because their wide receivers are not very good. Right. Yeah. This I mean, Gretchen's been is... making the, the bull case that he is their ex wide receiver, basically. I mean, that would I mean, be pretty a, sweet. He was a former wide receiver. I mean, he's a converted yeah. wide wide receiver. So, like, what yeah. if he is just their wide receiver one? Right. That's been like the Pitts bull case. We've been making the Pitts bull case that he's just a wide receiver, right? Who's classified as a tight end. And it, maybe that's true. But that's the thing for Waller is like, no, this dude's just going to have like a 28% target share, right? And, yeah. and yeah, yeah. down the field and in, in the end zone, et cetera. So now you dominated tight end. You didn't dominate quarterback, but you got basically elite quarterback production, but you know, at pick 105. And you got the whole Rams offense in Cooper Cup, which has actually pretty much been he has been the whole Rams offense for two years. So what does that mean now? Well, I know that I'm probably going to be attacking on a, a giant or a couple giants later, right? Let's say in this instance, I don't, I, uh, you know, because I will look at Saquon. In the second round because that's a pretty fun one you want to talk about two guys who could just be the whole offense in a game it's those two dudes i got one of the, i got a i passed on that once got him in the third oh that that well, feels good maybe i am going to try that now because uh the whole down once you once you get him that. in the third i'm like well i'm never i will never, never. take him in the second again <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i'll feel nothing if i stack him in a second i have to only get him in the third is that what it's like uh I feel like for you now, like when you enter like the Chihuahua, it's like, I don't know, man, I just won Best Ball Mania 3. And now I'm going to draft a 25 max $4, $4 tournament, uh, you know, 25 teams in two, day, in two, day, in I two w- days. I wish it was more like that. I got seven Chihuahuas in and then I was like, I got to get this article done, which I did get done. And it's, it's, a, it's currently in the hopper to go out Monday morning. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't max enter the Chihuahua, but I got in seven still. So, I d- so I'm not I, quite there. <laughs> I have not slept a lot over the course of the last couple of days and I'm blaming the Chihuahua because I did, I did get it in. Um, but there hasn't been a whole lot of sleep over the last 40, 48 hours. So thank you underdog. It was a very I, fun I contest. It. I love it as a contest, a small contest like that. Fast drafts only. I mean, it does only 25 max per, you know, 25 per person. So like, you know, us sickos can't just like take over the whole tournament, right. With a bunch of people drafting 150. Yeah. Um, it's and nice. it makes it, it's, if it's $4, it's even smaller. It's flat payout structure. Like there's, it's just natural that like it, they should create tournaments that make 
people question that are high entry drafters, like, is this really worth my time? Because that, <laughs> that way, like, there's <laughs> that way I'm not max entering it, right? Uh, yes. and, and a bunch of other sickos aren't max entering it, which is which is probably good for the ecosystem. Definitely. So, so anyway, just to wrap this Cooper Cup kind of Giants thing, because then I do want to. It's a, that one's a good segue to uh, what we've started. What we've started calling "oh shit" stacks here at Spike Week, which these two of these offenses could be considered that. But so Cooper Cup, right? Take Cooper Cup like, for this example. Say Saquon's not a thing, <clears throat> or, or I tried to push Saquon to the third because Kareem told me it's possible, and then it didn't work. So I don't have Saquon. <laughs> I know. I'll show you the team. <laughs> I know, I, I know that I'm going to be right. I know that players that make sense for this team, where they go later. And it's Waller in the eighties, Daniel Jones in the early one hundreds, and then nothing but late round guys, literally all late run cam makers. But um, let's throw him out for this example. So I know like for those from round two to, to Waller, Like I kind of have this freedom. And so then I take this step back and I say, okay, well, I know I want to be able to like set up another stack, right. With another quarterback. I know that maybe a a second round running back or that third, right. That, that a tier of pop, you know, Pollard, Chubb, Ramondre. So one of those guys could make sense, but I also know that I'm going to run into this zone of the draft after Daniel Jones Right. So like maybe before Waller or sometime around Waller and after Daniel Jones, or maybe even a, there's a guy in between those two where like eh, there's no wide receivers mm-hmm. like it, that's the juju zone right between Waller and Daniel Jones. And thereafter is like the juju zone, Odell, Zay Flower or uh, uh, Zay Jones, Jacoby Myers. So like, OK, there I'm probably going to be taking running backs, but at the end, I'm going to be taking these Giants and Rams wide receivers. So it's like then you it's like almost starts filling out your lineup for you because you know what you're going to try to do. Like literally all you did was take Cooper, Cup, take Cooper cup and you didn't take Saquon. And now like, okay, well, 85 is Waller. A hundred is Daniel Jones. And then my last two picks are these wide receivers. And then you say, okay, well, where do the running backs, where are they the best picks? You're like, Oh, okay. Well then let now let's drop Damian Harrison, the 10th round. Right. And, and Kendra Miller in the 11th round. And like, I just start dropping these guys into the team and you're like, Oh, it just like makes itself out. You're like, okay, I'll take a detour for a running back. Okay. Dobbins Dobbins. Right. Uh, I got three yeah. wide receivers. Let's take Dobbins here. Like, Oh, okay. Uh, I took Amari in the, in the third round. I'll, I'll, I'll take Watson as my other guy. Right. Maybe I took, maybe Brees was a detour and I, I somehow got Amari. Like, Oh, okay. Got that. Let's, let's throw a lot. This will be a Watson and a Daniel Jones team. Right. It's just like, it all just like falls together for you from a stacking perspective, when you like know what those games and those teams and right. The giants are such a good one because it's like, you want a giant stack, dude, take it whenever, whenever yeah, yeah. the hell you want. But knowing that, right. Like the Eagles are the opposite end. You want the Eagles first, second, third round. <laughs> like you have to know that too. So like, um, I just thought it was interesting, like because the, the the Rams Giants ones, it it like starts to make your draft for you when you've made like two selections. Yeah, and I would say so the Rams Giants one. Okay, what I like to do there is I continue correlating as I go through. You have this big range of the draft before you get to Waller, right? And you just keep correlating, keep correlating because Waller just got sniped. So this whole plan that you had yeah. is no longer actionable. A hundred percent. What what do you do now? Well. I took Terry McLaurin in the fourth, and then I took Brandon Ayuk in the fifth. So right there, I can go, all right, I can push that. That can be Purdy. You know, I've got that as a mm-hmm. setup. And that's already, you know, stack, bring back. You know, if Kittle comes, well, you would already get sniped on Waller, so you wouldn't have taken Kittle. But, you know, you can, get, you can grab Elijah Mitchell later on as one of your running backs, break a tie to that, continue betting on the 49ers that way. There aren't a ton of, like, other – I'm not tacking on Juwan Jennings or anything, but if I've got Ayuk, Elijah Mitchell, Purdy, I feel pretty good about that. Mm-hmm. If I didn't get Elijah Mitchell and I end up with Brian Robinson, right, and I'm a different human being, maybe I take <laughs> Sam Howell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I actually have yeah. taken Sam Howell occasionally, and that that would be one of those ways. Is I set up a Purdy thing, Purdy gets 
uh, he's moving up a bit. He gets sniped. And I'm like, you know, I really do need the other quarterback here. I'll grab Howell, whatever. I already had it set up for this game. So hopefully Howell's uh, out there and doing stuff. But um, if you – and it doesn't have to be that game, obviously. But you're you're just kind of like correlating things as you go within this window of flexibility that you talked about with this particular stack because that protects you from snipes. That is like if that original plan – you're not so locked in on that original plan. You've got it in the back of your mind as a it's possibility. your plan, but you have endless uh, yeah. fallback options. You you create and you create those fallback options as you go by continuing to build in correlation, adding. You know, I was talking about week seventeen correlation with the McLaren and Ayuk thing, but if you take Tyler Lockett, if you're on the other side of the board and you take Tyler Lockett and Jackson Smith and Jigba, you know, you've set yourself up for a Geno thing as a potential fallback. Or mm-hmm. just as a quarterback too, but just to be able to get a double stacked uh, quarterback too, if one of your stacks gets blown up, it's like, oh no, like I have a I have another bet on an offense without the quarterback because that whatever stack you had set up that doesn't go through, you still have it's just without the quarterback. Then you have a double stacked Geno, right, and then you figure out a way to get an additional third uh, stacked quarterback or third stacked team, your second stack quarterback on the roster, and at that point, it's a stronger team than it would have been. You know, this is the kind of the point that I was making in my article um, about, you know, not not worrying if someone snipes your quarterback so much. It obviously is a problem if you end up with like a jumble of random assorted players, like the chances that those particular guys end up being exactly the right guys is pretty low. You want to get things you want to put yourself in a position to get fewer things right. Right. Benefit on being right on just a few offenses, you know, take advantage of correlation. But if you, if that's something you want to do, why wouldn't you want to do it more? Why wouldn't you want to do it without having drafted a third quarterback, betting on teams without the quarterback, um, taking a wide receiver and a running back? This is something mm-hmm. I'm I'm looking into. This this is uh, after these articles go out uh, on running back uh, success rate, which is the next stuff I'll have out on site. I'm going to be looking into wide receiver one and running back stacks. So I think those are pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and that's a way it's a way of capturing an offense, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, mm-hmm. here's another, off, I'm just going to capture this. This offense is good. That's the bet. This offense is good. I've got the, and you could do that, right? I take a lot of uh, Ridley, Travis Etienne. Interesting. If I, I get like that, this. right. If I, if I get Trevor Lawrence, it's cause he, he fell. So now I've got, I've got that. And like, I'm talking late seventh uh, Trevor Lawrence. I feel good about late seventh Trevor Lawrence, even though I don't right. draft much Trevor Lawrence. Yep. But if I don't get Trevor Lawrence, so what? I've got the running back and the wide receiver one on the Jaguars. I mean, if the Jaguars are good, I'm putting up points. So that's like that's another way <clears throat> I, I try to think through. That's not week 17 correlation. That's just a stack, just a bet. Jaguars. And then if the quarterback falls in your lap, great. And I think everybody thinks about what you're talking about here and what we're talking about through this lens of week 17, because it's become so popular. And I mean, shit, we've done, (laughs) we've recorded here uh, conversations about how to use it and and how to correlate in week 17, how to right? I drafted, um, let's say I drafted uh, Keenan Allen and then Jerry Judy fall, or, or I get to that wide receiver. I I drafted Keenan Allen. I get to this dead zone. Ah, Cortland Sutton's the best wide receiver. I need a wide receiver. Okay, I choose him because he correlates. That's fine. I, I, there's nothing else to say about that. But I think people have now almost put this idea of week 17 sometimes ahead of what we're talking about here. And it's not you can do both. You can have your cake and this is one of those where you can have your cake and and eat it too. And the sniping thing is such a good point because a lot of the times people will just go through and draft their favorite player or draft a guy that's at the top of the ADP list or whatever. And then that snipe tends to hurt because you set up some, you set up one thing. And when it doesn't go according to plan, that whole team is fucked. As opposed to you navigate your way through this draft. And like you said, okay, I got cup. Now I'm set up for the Rams second round. Garrett Wilson. Okay, now I'm set up for the Jets, right? Uh, okay, now I'm going to take my nice detour. Value. Now I'm going <laughs> to, yeah, exactly, exactly. Garrett Wilson fell uh, for the first yes. time, literally in the in 2023 fantasy football 
Uh, <laughs> whoever in the third round, right? Then then you get the the uh, you take McLaurin as your fourth round pick, and then like you said, okay, well I get to the seventh round instead of just taking, right? I don't have anybody, you know. Instead of just taking Gabe, I like Gabe again this year too. Instead of just taking Gabe because he's my favorite seventh rounder, well, I don't have a quarterback yet. Let's give myself outs to this Washington thing, right? So I'm just going to take Dotson on this one, right? So now, like, I've drafted this whole way to be like, like, kind of like, he's like, go ahead and snipe me or whatever it was that you, you know, like, please, please snipe me. It's like, I don't, I didn't say, I considered calling it please snipe me. And then I was like, I'm, it's May, dude. You don't want to have the worst summer yeah. of your life. Don't title an article, <laughs> yes. please snipe me. Because people will do it, especially because you, you know, when you won last year, people go, oh, I see Daily Rojo in here, and he literally said to snipe me, so I'm going to piss away my $25 to make him miserable. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, but that's the stack. You said it earlier with Week 17 does this, and just general offense stacking does this. It not only, like, gets you maybe onto some guy, you know, whether it's spreading out your exposure or getting guys on the teams that they should be drafted on, like the Kincaid thing. It's not even necessarily evening out exposures, but it's like, I'm just going to have Kincaid. So like on those five Kincaid teams, if it hits those, those teams are winning a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. This allows you to like be a good drafter and never get sniped and never, you know, you know, not, not never get sniped, never worry about being sniped. Never worry about you get to the end of the draft like, well, fuck, I don't have any stacks. You know, <laughs> I took an unstacked Desmond Ritter and an unstacked, you know, Mac Jones or whatever. Because when you're siding with stacking and mapping things out along as you go, you can like never create a bad team. It may not be the team you wanted or the team you intended to draft like at the beginning, but you're like, so whether it's a Howell team or a Daniel Jones team or a Purdy team, or a Ritter team, or a Stafford team, or, you know, whatever. It didn't matter because you were set for everything along the way. It just kind of depended upon what the room, then that is, what did the room give you? But it's, you kind of took it first, you took yeah. it from the room, and then you let them give you amongst five or six different options. That's exactly, yeah, I love that. Um, <clears throat> you know, and for example, you could go uh, Ridley ETN, and then five, six, you could go Jackson Smith and Jigba, Tyler Lockett, right? And then it's like, all right, room, are you going to give me seventh round Trevor Lawrence? If not, I can very easily get Geno with this stack. You know, I get tenth round Geno if I feel like I, I want to like reach a little bit there. But, um, you know, I've I've done that because once you have that kind of double stack locked up, I don't mind a a little bit of a reach for yeah for Geno there. I can you pull up this team? I yep. I uh this is a best ball mania team that I drafted recently. Um I'll read it out for the for the audio listeners as well. But so I'm out of the eleven hole here. I want AJ Brown, Devontae Adams, and then Calvin Ridley, Travis Etienne. So doing this is why I brought this team up, did this exact thing. Uh then I grabbed Michael Pittman, which correlates with Devontae Adams. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I got Deontay Johnson. Just, you know, take a pretty good pick there. Also, um, but also Ste you're, you're you have outs to Steelers. I have outs to right? Steelers. Pick, 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 pick it is later. Um, I'm trying to see if Lockett is already off the board or Lockett he, he probably was goes. not off the board. I could have but, gone Lockett, but yeah. I felt like I've taken a lot of Lockett and I was like, I'll just take Deontay. And yeah, mm -hmm. I have the Steelers out. Um, I also have here the Adams Michael Pittman mini correlation, which gives me Anthony Richardson. Um, then round seven and eight. This is the big thing. Round seven. Trevor Lawrence makes it all the way back. But I take a look at the round 12 team. I wrote about this on Legendary Upside called Dictating the Turns, where I, where I you know, kind of trying to force that extra little value out of the room. Yep. This guy has Deshaun Watson. He can uh, hurt me, but also probably hurt himself by taking unstacked Trevor Lawrence. Um, doesn't really make any sense for his team. So I went ahead and took Dallas Goddard, who's a really nice value at 7-Eleven. And correlates with AJ e. Brown, Brown. Mm -hmm. two Eagles, right? So then I push Trevor Lawrence around the corner, a little bit of a heart in the throat moment, but I get him at 802. <laughs> that, I mean, I don't draft a lot of Trevor Lawrence, but I love him at 802. That's got to be one of the deepest fall, the furthest falls for, for, I know he falls here and there, but 86 is a big fall. 
yeah, this was this was a fun one. So then uh, Zach Charbonnet, who I take a ton of um, in the late ninth, but he correlates with uh, my yeah, my Steelers bet. And then I take Pat, Pat, uh, Pat Fryermuth. So now I've set up. I got my bring back. Seahawks are running all over the Steelers. Steelers have to throw to catch up, which seems like the most realistic way in which they would throw a lot in week <laughs> 17. So I kind of like that. Uh, grab Zay Jones at the 11 11. Uh, it's stacked with Lawrence. This guy at this point starts scooping up every available running back. So I ended up reaching a lot on Roshan Johnson, grab Devin Singletary, which takes me to what four running backs at that point. Uh, I have Travis Etienne, Zach Charbonnet, Roshan Johnson, Devin Singletary. So get that fourth running back through the end of the 13th, which feels pretty solid. Uh, that's generally like a mark I try to hit. Uh, if possible, I won't like force it, but that's like a nice little checkpoint. And then Kenny Pickett, round 14. So beautiful. Uh, then I tacked on some, I tacked on Leonard Fournette. I tacked on uh, some some cheap pieces on this Colts Raiders things that I built out. So I didn't get Anthony Richardson, but I still took Hunter Renfro, Michael Mayer, Josh Downs. Love it. Just bet on Raiders. Raiders are better than people think. Colts can pass a little bit. And the whole team is, is, I bet I've got a thing on the Eagles. I've got Steelers bring back. I didn't get a bring back actually on the Trevor Lawrence one, but, that, but I didn't, I just figured it, I'm not forcing that. Right. I'm not taking right. Terrace Marshall here. I can take Michael Mayer with my very last pick, who I think is like a much stronger bet than the eight, oh, 1802. So that's one thing where I didn't go with the correlation, but I did, didn't I? Because I had already, it's my third Raider and I've got two Colts coming back. So to me, I'm not really even sacrificing like a bring back necessarily. Technically, I am on my quarterback. The, the game I would like to go off the most is that um, Jaguars game, but I also have ETN. So what if it's ETN who you need in week 17? I've got a couple other games stacked up. That's just kind of the way I think about this stuff. So two things that jumped out to me here is, A, fuck you, that team is awesome. Uh, and <laughs> you executed it. You executed it uh, really well. But what really jumped out, like with the Jags thing, and you'll see this all the time, is so we know inherently that like ADP value is is uh, important. Someone I, I absolutely hate when someone calls me and my AirPods pick up like my cell phone during the conversation. It, it all fucks everything up. Uh, but that that just happened. So uh, regaining my train my train of thought when you do things like you did with Calvin Ridley. And, and Travis Etienne, a lot of the times it works the best with like the wide receivers, but you can create, right? It's like the, the leverage thing manufactured or, you know, uh, uh, dropped in your lap. You can create your own ADP value like you did with Trevor Lawrence sometimes. Yeah. Another perk of these stacks is that you, you don't guarantee it because sometimes like you said, okay, I, I'm just going to, reach for gene right i took jsn and lock it and and when you're at the turn things can be different too because you don't ha you're, you're not afforded the ability to just pick off value like you are if you're drafting in you know at the five or the six or something like that so it's not you know it, there's nuance but like the lawrence thing is such a good example w only one guy had christian kirk you had ridley and etn no one else is incentivized to take trevor lawrence and if you're in a room where everybody's kind of staying in their own lane you're going to, you can create this ADP value, right? You can create two rounds of fucking 80, which is what you did create like two rounds of ADP value on Trevor Lawrence by taking those skill guys. If you don't get it, you don't get it. You still have that bet. You just walked through all the different things you set up, right? I, I, I literally have not drafted Jimmy Garoppolo once, but if someone wanted to say, look, you're set for Jimmy Garoppolo, you're set for Anthony Richardson, you were set for Kenny Pickett, right? You're, you're, you set yourself up for all these different things. So if you did, if the Lawrence thing didn't happen, it didn't happen. But the only way to find out, the only way for it to happen is to do what you did. And every once in a while, it's going to happen. It's like, the again, it's like the leverage thing. You manufactured that ADP value. And if you do this over and over and over in every draft, you're almost guaranteeing, right? You were basically guaranteed that like, who the fuck is taking all of the quarterbacks that I've tried? <laughs> like, like right. everyone would be taking like you don't necessarily know which one it's going to be in this case it was lawrence next draft it might be anthony richardson next the next time it's going to be kenny pickett because you took both maybe you took deontay pickens and fryer right so 
when everybody else is picking their late round guy, why the fuck would anybody else take Kenny Pickett? They don't have any Steelers on their team. They're going to take Stroud yeah. or Bryce Young or whatever. So like you can create these things. So it's not just like, you're not just evening out exposure. You're not just right. Like uh, uh, breaking ties and all that. You are doing those things, but you're also just by stacking, creating these leverage spots and ADP these things that we know are good it has all these downstream effects to it yeah and i didn't push trevor lawrence to the 802 just to like get cute and get to show this team on a stream although it certainly is perk um <laughs> the dallas goddard is sitting there at 711 and the team at uh at the 12 hole did not have a tight end dallas goddard's a huge value i think it's 711 again i did have aj brown so it's a, a continued bet on the eagles i'm, I'm not going to go back and get hurts but like you got to pay up for Hertz, right? I can get Hertz as weapons and get there if I can fill in the quarterback at a much, much cheaper price. This is like one of those DFS things, right? If I can pay, you know, five thousand dollars for my quarterback, you know, instead of eight thousand or whatever, then I'm in a position where Sam I don't Howell, score as many one. points. That's going to be Sam Howell in in week one. On, on hey, I'll, I'll could, play Sam Howell in DFS. I will I play script, Sam Howell in DFS. I can script Sunday the Sunday morning show on Roto Grinders that I will be doing uh, people Do as if they haven't. Heard, yeah, let's just go ahead and record this. I actually don't know who they the shocker. I don't know week one schedule. Uh, we all Roto Pat was so tilted this time last year. Roto Pat was like, Wait, you don't know the week one schedule? I was like, No, and by the way, it wasn't this time last year, it was like late August. He was like, You don't know the week one schedule? And <laughs> they play like, in three weeks, and you don't know who plays in week one, but I could no in clue. my sleep, I fucking recite the week 17 schedule. You know? He was legitimately irritated. He was like, What has happened to your brain? Oh my god, they play the Cardinals. It oh, is. Baby. Oh, it is Sam Howell to Jahan Dotson season in wow. in uh, in week one. Anyway, well, he's not getting benched in that game. All yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I yeah. I just kind of want to point out that like okay, ha let's say um, the guy at the seven hole needed a quarterback, and uh, you know already had a tight end. I would have flipped that. I would have said mm -hmm. what has a better chance of getting back. I would have taken Lawrence. Lawrence obviously a huge value too. So. Um, you can manufacture these little extra ADP squeezes around the turns, but what are you getting for it? If I didn't, if it was like, even if it was like, he didn't have a, he already has a quarterback. Um, but I don't like really care what other player I get right. on this turn. I would take Lawrence. Like, I don't think you want to just push it for the sake of pushing it. But in this case, I'm sitting at a huge value correlated Dallas Goddard. Don't have a tight end yet. Um, I want to try to get both. I agree. Um, and it's, it's such a good point because I, I do think people say, well, I can't, I can, you know, oh, he, ha yeah, he has a quarterback. I don't need to take him here. But you're like, you're just deciding between two wide receivers that you yeah, don't really give a shit. You don't give a shit. Well, just take him. Yeah. Just, just yeah. take him then. It's like the Gino thing before. It's like, ah, a little bit ahead of ADP, but like, he makes the most sense here. There's nobody else I want. Right. That That's what happens to me. There, again, those, those pockets of the draft exist too. Right. It's that's why nothing is ever, done in a silo done in a done in a vacuum is like you're constantly what who's on the board what pocket of the draft i'm in what do my opponents have right uh what do i what do i need to be thinking about down the road right all these different things have to play in um that's actually why why uh we've spent on this bull these bulldog videos that we've done you know they're slow the bulldogs are slow drafts uh the, the, i forget which if it was round three and four or five and six or something like that you know so two picks right if you're in a fast draft, you that's a to one minute total that you have maximum to make those those two picks when you're on the clock. We spent an hour and a half <laughs> debating who to take between, between between four people. But that's when you think about it, like the fast draft is kind of crazy because our brain is trying to process like right, like yeah. what you just did in that draft. You just processed like 20 different things that we've mostly talked about on this on this show, all in once in a in the in the blink of an eye. All that stuff is what we discussed for an a fucking hour and a half <laughs> to figure out who to pick on a show, and and but we're we're having to do it within twenty to twenty five seconds because you know you have to have to ma make the pick too. You have to do so. You have to make figure out these things in twenty seconds uh, when you're on the clock, and so it is it is kind of crazy uh, to think about it. <laughs> I'm not gonna say to wrap. Because uh, we got made fun of a lot, and I got made fun of a lot uh, a few episodes. I actually do have an out, so we we, I, need to wrap. Uh, we, we actually are <laughs> going to wrap, I promise. Uh, I just want to talk about, like I said, what we call kind of like, oh, shit stacks. 
being, so we just talked about how to not get yourself into these situations, but sometimes it happens. Things don't play out your way. You, you tried to set up three, four or five different stacks and it just didn't work right? You got sniped, or maybe you decided when you got to the 12th round, when you were going to take Derek Carr, somebody else was on the board, somebody else there fell. And you were like, well, I can't, I, I can't pass on this guy in the 12th round. Now you got to the 15th round and you don't have sacks built out. You, you do a, how often w- will you prioritize, right? Like, uh, so Mac Jones, Hunter Henry, Devonte Parker, Tyquan Thornton, uh, you know, those kinds of guys are like readily available back there. Uh, uh, you know, if you like how, like me, Curtis Samuel, as you mentioned, is available back there. Logan Thomas is back there. Jordan Love, if, if he falls or whatever, you have Musgrave and Jaden Reed and those guys back there. There's a bunch of these ways to still build these stacks in. CJ Stroud, that, I think, is, is a really Stroud good one. Stroud is a really, Stroud is a good one. Uh, Bryce Young has Hayden Hurst back there. And <laughs> I guess you can take Mingo Harris, too. I don't mind where Mingo, Mingo goes. So you take mm-hmm. him and, you know. But how I'm trying, I'm trying to think about how to phrase this because I think these are like a necessity for any drafter to have in their back pocket and make sure to go to, but like how often are these things happening in your, in your drafts? And like, are you like trying to avoid them? Are you, you know, we are talking about the like plan ahead type thing in our draft. We know we have a Mac Jones stack always in our back pocket, but then the next thing, you know, if you don't, like if you if you lean on that crutch too much, the next thing you know, you're like massively overweight a Mac Jones Hunter Henry stack, which I'm not saying that whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent, but that may not have been your intention, right? Right on, on May 1st when you started drafting BBM, you probably didn't say, "Oh yeah, load me up all the Mac Jones and Hunter Henry." But then when the contest closes, because you've had to backdoor into this so much, you end up way overweight on that. Like, how do you think about some of these things? And is that something that you run into frequently with these backdoor stacks? The way I think about it generally, I don't want to be doing a lot of that to the point where I actually like Mac Jones. And I just realized I'm underweight on him now. Cause I, I don't like to put myself in that situation, but Mac Jones, you know, if I'm going to play that game, I would prefer to play it with Allen as my quarterback. And then, um, but I probably need to take more Mac Jones actually. But I would like to, you know, maybe take Hopkins or have Gabe, you know, already like have built out a Bills thing that didn't happen and then tack a Mac Jones stack onto that. Yeah. Or if I'm going to do the Stroud one, I'd rather have Burks if possible, you know, at least give me a bring back. I'd rather have Derrick Henry. Um, I'd rather have Damian Pierce and at least just have like a premium mm-hmm. piece of like this. This offense is going to be better than people expect. Well, you know, the starting running back would benefit from that a lot. So to the extent that is that is possible, you know, with the Jaguar stuff, like the Jaguar is one that I outlined earlier. What if Lawrence didn't come back? Well, I probably prioritize Mingo a little bit more and see if I can play that as a Bryce Young thing. I like right? it. And maybe instead of Pickett, it's a Bryce Young thing. And, you know, I figure, you know, maybe I reach on Richardson in the eighth a little bit, whatever. You know, there's a million ways to do it. But the, um, the, the point is, when I'm doing these backdoor stacks, I would prefer to have already set up a bring back on them or a premium piece on it to the extent that's possible. And the way that I don't have to fall back on them more than I want is that I'm doing minis throughout the draft where I'm building, you know, consecutive, you know, I'm building little double stacks at various points throughout the draft, okay. that Friar Muth pick to go with Deontay Johnson. Right. I'm like, all right, sick. I already have a, I already have a double stack. The, the way I think about it, Deontay Johnson, Pat Fryermuth, and Zach Charbonnet is a fun little three-piece stack. Do I have to have Kenny Pickett on that? No, I do not. I absolutely don't care if I have Kenny Pickett if the team is already set at quarterback. That's how I'm kind of thinking through. Like, these little things go together. These little things go together. And then if I need to tackle on the quarterback or it falls in such a way that it's really nice to do, amazing. If I, if I need to you know, find another quarterback. Hopefully I've already set myself up for one. And that again is like one of these downstream benefits of, of doing these stacks is, is what two thing one, you, the least important part of your stack is that quarterback. So it allows you this flexibility to just drop that least important piece in, depending upon what this draft gives you. Right. Like I said earlier, you took these stacks away from the, away from the the rest of your opponents. And then you kind of just laid it on the table and let them hand you the last piece. 
the least important piece, right? You put the whole puzzle together and they gave you that last, they gave you that last, that last piece. It also, these, these oh shit stacks, right? These, these late back door stacks make you feel better about yourself, right? Like I have, I definitely have too much of the Mac Jones Hunter Henry because I do like to push things and shit happens mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in drafts. The problem is that in truly in practice, those are not the things that are really going to win you best ball tournaments, but a late stack with some premium options, as you mentioned, mixed in. And that's why building out these stacks, even without the quarterback are so impactful is because like you said, look, is Mac Jones going to score 40 points with, with three touchdowns or four touchdowns going to Hunter Henry in any given week? No, you're just getting them because look, I need a quarterback. I need a late round tight end. They're good values, whatever. But if you build for the case in which they really do blow up in a given week, it's going to include, right? Like you said, Traylon Burks, the way in which that Houston, Tennessee game blows up is not, is not CJ Stroud to Robert Woods with Kyle Phillips as the bring back. Like that's not winning you best ball mania for. I'm just like, sorry if you've drafted. (laughs) I don't, I haven't done the Phillips part. I'm I'm not trying to be a a, not trying to be a hater. I got plenty of my own (laughs) shitty, shitty back. No, no, you're right. But Stroud, Robert Woods, Kyle Phillips, but like, we'll do it because we're like, ah, I'm breaking ties with this. Right. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not even saying don't ever do that, but I'm saying if you really want to like gain the juice around some of these backdoor stacks, I think it has to do with thinking about this stacking and correlation as you go throughout the draft, right? Like the real juice is that CJ Stroud has Nico, maybe Nico. And then you have Robert Woods and you had Traylon Burks on that team. Maybe you drafted Chig because you drafted Traylon. You take Chig as your, as your tight end. Next thing you know, it's like, Okay, now this game has some fucking juice. Now, like now we got juice. I can win this whole thing. Like Kyle Phillips <laughs> as your only Titan or whatever, as a bring back to Robert Woods, is really just like making you feel better about the team, but it's not really gaining you much win equity. I agree. And you think about okay, everyone has these backdoor Stroud stacks, these backdoor Jones stacks. But if you have the, the confidence and the courage to actually stack up that game like for real, which no one wants to do that. That's why they're that's why they're sitting there is oh well, I can tack that on because I didn't think about yep. this until now and no one wants them and I'll just tack them on. But if you're like, no no no, this game's going off. I'm, <laughs> I'm betting on it to be a like really high scoring. <laughs> like if it does go off, if that Mac Jones team actually does have some juice, like you act you have the premium pieces. You've got the Bills coming back on it. You yeah you know, you took the Hopkins before he signed there and you know, whatever, but um, God forbid you, you include Juju, you know, I mean, if you're going to take Juju, it, if, yep. it would be nice to have it correlated with some bills. You get Mac later. Um, I don't really see how Juju crushes me, but that would be how, right? Like mm-hmm. it would be in a week 17 unpredictable shootout where the bills go off. They have to throw a ton. Juju catches uh, 11 balls for, 47 yards and two touchdowns <laughs> and uh, he's the guy you need. Exactly. Exactly. So we do got to get out of here. Um, there will be plenty more stacking conversation over the course of the summer. It is clearly uh, an important subject, but a nuanced one. I'm sure it will come up on, on future shows. Um, and I like your idea that you mentioned before. Maybe that's what we'll talk about next week with kind of, uh, you know, your, you're, you have a plan of attack for exposure, but like, right. it's a, again, it's a snake trap. You don't just get to pick, you know, it's not DFS. I don't get to create a uh, 150 lineups exactly how I want them to be. I have to do it with the draft. So be on the lookout for that. Um, next week, of course, I fucked up and did not uh, get, read kind of our promotion at the very top. So for the sickos that are still hanging around two hours in, if you are a legendary upside subscriber, you get 40% off of a Spike Week subscription. So it's part of why we're doing this show. We have a little bit of a, a partnership. The people who are reading Legendary Upside are clearly uh, you know, deep into the fantasy football and probably best ball space and Spike Week. We offer um, really some of the only tools in all of best ball and for the people that are taking this pretty seriously. And so you get 40% off. Use promo code Leg Up when you sign up on Spike Week. And you'll automatically get 40% off as long as you stay subscribed to both Legendary Upside and Spike Week. Anything else before we get out of here? I know you got to go. We both got to go. 
Uh, I'll just say legendaryupside.com slash early. You can still get $30 off uh, your first year. There's less than a month to go on that promotion. So if you're considering signing up, good time to sign up. And then that's how you get the 40% off spike week as well. That is perfect. Um, thank you guys for all of the kind wishes. I did I did just want to close with, uh, and we took a little couple week hiatus and I got tons of messages and tons of pings in Discord and tons of, uh, hey, where the hell is Legendary Sickos? You know, it's been a part of my uh, weekly routine now. So I appreciate all the amazing feedback and comments and everything. You can find it both on the Spike Week YouTube channel and the Legendary Upside YouTube channel. We post it on both and podcast feeds. Everywhere you get your audio, video, everything for Legendary Upside and Spike Week uh, for myself and for Pat. And I can't believe all of our, both your dog and my dog st stayed quiet during this. Oh, whole, well, he was jumping time. up on the couch. He was, <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw my arm going like this. He needed a lot of attention earlier. I was, I was giving a lot of pets. Jump on I, my arm at one point. It was funny watching him uh, look, look out the window, but he still stayed mostly quiet. And yeah, he's good. I'm also a little. Mine didn't even like come in the room, so I'm kind of partially terrified about what they've been doing for the last uh, two hours. So at one point, he I'm, banged in the cage because he was getting on my arm. <laughs> I'm going like, <laughs> the cage is all shaking. <laughs> but for me and for Pat and for all these crazy Man, uh, four-legged uh, fur babies, we will see you guys next week. Those were some spicy takes. Want to stay up to date with all of the other spicy takes we're going to have over here at Spike Week? Why don't you press that subscribe button below? If you turn notifications on, we draft a team, boom, you know about it. We have another spicy take, boom, you know about it. You can be there. You can draft with us. You want to stay up to date? That's how you do it. All right, we'll catch you later next time here at Spike Week.